Good morning. I'm Councilmember Daniel Drum, and I'm chair of the Committee on Finance. Welcome to today's oversight hearing on the deal entered into between Amazon, New York City, and New York State for Amazon to locate its second headquarters, or HQ2, in Long Island City, Queens. I'm joined by my colleagues uh, on the Council, starting um, with uh, Councilmember Steve Matteo, Councilmember Barry Grudenchik, Councilmember Adrian Adams, Councilmember Jamie Van Bremer, of course our speaker is here as well, and I'm sure other council members will be joining us shortly. The title of today's hearing is Amazon HQ2, Stage 2. Does the Amazon deal deliver for New York City residents? This hearing is the council's second hearing on the deal. The first hearing, which was held on December 12th by the Committee on Economic Development, chaired by Councilmember Paul Vallone, focused on the closed door process of getting Amazon to New York City. As the second oversight hearing, and in my role as finance chair, the purpose of today's hearing is to conduct an in-depth review and evaluation of the economic and tax incentives offered to Amazon and to examine the citywide cost and impacts of the deal to assess whether the city is getting a good bang for its buck. Before continuing, I'd like to thank the speaker, Corey Johnson, for being at today's hearing and give him an opportunity to say some opening remarks. Mr. Speaker. Uh, thank you, uh, Chair Drum. Good morning. I'm Corey Johnson, Speaker of the New York City Council, and I'd like to thank everyone for coming here today for this very important hearing on the Amazon deal. This deal, arguably the largest economic development deal this city has ever seen, not only impacts community residents in Queens, but all New Yorkers alike, and today's hearing is going to focus on these citywide issues. I would like to thank EDC and Amazon for being present with us today to continue the dialogue we began at the first oversight hearing in December. And while I certainly appreciate the breadth and depth of information you can provide, I am disappointed that the Empire State Development Corporation again chose to decline our invitation to testify. I understand that they have made themselves available for other forums and panels to discuss the deal, and I think that it is a shame that they refuse to come before the Council, the representative body of the people of New York City, to shed some light on a deal that they were involved in orchestrating. As mentioned by Chair Drum, the purpose of today's hearing is to conduct an in-depth review and evaluation of the economic and tax incentives offered to Amazon and to examine citywide costs and impacts of the deal to the city as a whole. From the outset, I want to state that the Council as a body has not yet determined whether this deal is a good deal or not a good deal for the city. What we're here today is to ask questions, conduct oversight, and gather information. This needs to be done because it is clear from the Council's first hearing and the manner of which the deal was rolled out that this was a secretive process intentionally structured to avoid a substantive public review in advance of any commitments being made. At the first hearing, we discussed at length that the process circumvented the Uniform Land Use Review Procedure, or ULERP, which is a process laid out in our city charter to review and approve deals of this type and size in our city. I don't want to rehash the council skepticism and displeasure of that choice, but I mention ULERP as a contrast for how the negotiations and analyses were conducted in the case of Amazon. When we consider a ULERP action, a rezoning action, a land use action, we get the facts first. We negotiate extensively, we hear from the community and the public, and then only then, once we have all the information, the plans, the data, we make a well-reasoned decision, do we approve this deal or do we not approve this deal? Does this deal need more negotiation? Does this deal need more protection for workers? Does this deal need more benefits for the public? In this case, this deal was done backwards. The city and the state made a deal with Amazon for HQ2 in Long Island City and agreed to give away at least $3 billion in public subsidy before they did their due diligence. They signed an MOU, a Memorandum of Understanding, before an environmental impact study was done, before any citywide studies were conducted about how this would affect the housing market in Western Queens or in the city as a whole. 
They did this before we were able to determine an additional need for school seats. And before we looked at additional congestion on the seven line. And before there were any significant agreements from Amazon about what they would be providing to support their move to the city on a scale that one would expect to see from one of the world's most valuable companies owned by one of the world's richest people. I think the company's worth almost a trillion dollars and I think Jeff Bezos is worth somewhere in the tune of $150 billion. At the prior hearing, EDC and Amazon both testified that this work in negotiation was just starting. After the deal had been made, I for one do not understand how New York City and New York State could have signed an MOU without a fuller understanding of how HQ2 could shape our city for the next several decades or without any concrete guarantees from Amazon about what additionally they would give. So instead, we as a council are left to conduct an after-the-fact review of the agreement to learn more and to make public all the facts of the deal. And because the analyses have thus far been publicly released by ESD and EDC, has been lacking, I have directed the City Council's Finance Division to put together a white paper that outlines exactly how an economic development deal such as Amazon should be evaluated and highlights the questions that should be asked before signing on the dotted line. Part one of that white paper is available and attached uh, to the hearing report today. Uh, it's part of the appendix of today's committee report and it's also available online on our city council website if you want to take a look at it. As representatives of the people of New York City and stewards of the city's budget, it is the city council's responsibility to take a critical look at the full package from a citywide perspective. The mayor himself said it best in 2013. He said, government must focus on the needs of families, must be the protector of neighborhoods, and must guard the people from the enormous power of moneyed interests. That is the essence of what we are here to do today. As a reminder, the council will have at least one additional oversight hearing on the Amazon deal to be conducted by the Committee on Land Use and a separate hearing solely dedicated for public testimony so any member of the public can come and testify. The dates of those hearings will be made available in the coming weeks. And although we are not taking public testimony at today's hearing, we want to hear from the public and we encourage you to submit any questions about today's hearing to the City Council on Twitter using the hashtag, hashtag AmazonAnswersNYC. We will keep the hashtag up on the screen for the duration of this hearing, and we will pose some of the questions submitted to the representatives of Amazon and EDC who are here. Since our time is limited today, we ask that questions submitted be about the financial incentives Amazon will receive from the deal and the costs and impacts that it will have on the city. I want to thank, again, you all for being here. Uh, I appreciate you living up to your word and saying that you would come back and testify, and I look forward uh, to a hearing today that answers many of the questions that we have. And now I will turn it back to our Finance Committee Chair, Danny Drum, for the remainder of his opening statement. Uh, thank you, Speaker Johnson, and thank you for your leadership on this important issue. As the Speaker referenced, both Empire State Development and the Economic Development Corporation put out their analysis of the economic and fiscal impact of the Amazon deal on New York City. These reports estimate that the deal will generate $27 billion in additional revenue, while only costing $3 billion in tax expenditures, leading to the governor and the mayor's claims that we will be receiving a nine-to-one return on investment. I'll comment on those specific numbers in a moment, but the first question we need to address is why did the city and state choose to issue such limited analysis of the deal? Neither evaluation accounted for any cost or impacts accommodating Amazon's growth in the city. Of course, there will be additional cost when bringing an estimated 130,000 new people into the city. Those people will need to be housed, educated, transported, and protected. How much will that cost? What will the influx of skilled, well-paid workers into the city do to our already escalating affordable housing crisis? 
and what will happen to our homegrown and existing tech companies that will now have to compete with the publicly subsidized behemoth for employees. Instead of delving into these important analyses, both reports simply reviewed the expected tax gains and compared that to the cost of the tax expenditures and other financial incentives. And then, when the deal was announced, Mayor de Blasio said it was a giant step on our path to building an economy in New York City that leaves no one behind. Similarly, the governor said, New York can proudly say that we have attracted one of the largest, most competitive economic development investments in United States history. But without having done a full citywide impact analysis, how do they know that this will be to the advantage of city residents in the long run? Yes, the jobs are coming, but there is so much more that needs to be evaluated and considered, including whether the jobs would have come without such a hefty incentive package. Now, back to the specific numbers. Amazon is promising to construct 4 million square feet of commercial space in 10 years, with the possibility of expanding up to 8 million square feet over 15 years, with a total $3.6 billion capital investment. In addition, Amazon is expected to create 25,000 jobs by 2029, with the potential to create 40,000 jobs by 2034, with an average annual salary of $150,000. All totaled, as I mentioned, ESD and EDC conclude that $27 billion in tax revenue will be generated. According to city and state officials in exchange, Amazon will receive at least $1.2 billion in discretionary Excelsior tax credits from the state, a $505 million discretionary capital grant from the state, $897 million in as of right relocation and employment assistance program business tax credits from the city. $386 million in as of right industrial and commercial abatement program property tax credits from the city, and an additional discretionary benefit on the city-owned parcels where the city agreed to reduce the amount of the payment in lieu of taxes or pilots by the amount of ICAP benefit the parcel would have been eligible to receive if it were owned by Amazon. But these numbers are not an apples-to-apples -apples comparison because the benefits are magnified and the cost minimized. When the tax gains were calculated, it was assumed that Amazon would be building out 8 million square feet and creating 40,000 jobs. But when reporting on the cost of the incentives, it was assumed that 4 million square feet would be constructed and only 25,000 jobs would be created. According to the Council's calculations, when properly accounted for, the ICAP benefit could in fact reach up to $830 million and REAP could be up to $1.44 billion for a total of about $2.3 billion in city incentives exclusive of the discretionary pilot benefit. Given the size of this deal, the people of the City of New York deserve straightforward facts without the use of misleading numbers. Moreover, at the first hearing, we repeatedly heard from Amazon that it intends to be a quote-unquote good neighbor to Long Island City and the city as a whole. But what does this really mean? Will it treat its workforce well and allow them to organize? Will it play the aggressive tax avoidance game it has used in the past? Will it use its significant market power to lobby against policies intended to ameliorate the effects of its presence? When our new neighbor is the world's most valuable company and it is moving in through a process designed to extract as large a public subsidy as possible, what can New York City realistically expect about Amazon's future behavior? Certainly, looking at Seattle as a case study is instructive. I'm going to close by quoting Joseph Perilla, a fellow at the Brookings Institute, who posed the following question about Amazon's coming to New York City. Will Amazon's arrival actually benefit local residents or simply exacerbate existing structural inequities? This question will guide the committee 
uh, in the, in the uh, guide the committee and the council as we prepare for additional details and come to our own conclusions about the merit of Amazon coming to New York City. I'd like to take a moment now to thank some of the staff here at the council for their work on this hearing. From the Council's Finance Division, I'd like to thank Senior Counsel Rebecca Chasen, Assistant Counsel Stephanie Ruiz, Chief Ec Economist Dr. Ray Majoski, Assistant Director Emra Edev, Economist Kira McDonald, and Principal Finance Analyst Aliyah Ali. Before hearing testimony, I'm going to turn it over to Councilmember Van Bremer, in whose district the headquarters would be located for his brief remarks. Councilmember Van Bremer. Thank you very much, Chair Drum and Speaker Johnson, uh, for your leadership. At a time when we should all be concerned with growing income inequality, we are confronted by a deal that literally takes billions in hard-earned tax dollars paid by janitors, teachers, and bus drivers only to give it to a man worth reportedly $160 billion. And yet we often hear there isn't enough money for mass transit, schools, libraries, and parks. Now quite recently in a speech, Mayor de Blasio spoke about this very dilemma. He said, and I quote, we actually do have the money to solve the problems. And I know where the money is, he said. This country has spent decades taking from the working people and concentrating the wealth in the hands of the 1%. That's where the money is. He added, there's plenty of money in this country. It's just in the wrong hands. Which brings us to the Amazon deal and an over $3 billion act of corporate giveaway of taxpayer dollars to make the richest of the rich even more rich. The mayor and the governor signed off on this deal. I will not. The city council has not. The question I've been asking myself is how much is too much? In a world where so many are hungry at night, cold all day, and unable to afford a doctor when they inevitably get sick, how can so much wealth be concentrated in so few hands? And how does the city and state celebrate a deal that exacerbates income inequality? We often hear that it's too much or we're going too far when it comes to giving poor or working class people more and better health care. It would be too much of a burden for all workers to be unionized. But we never hear those same people say that Jeff Bezos and people worth tens of billions of dollars have too much damn money. This Amazon debacle must be an inflection point for our society, where we rein in corporate welfare and the billionaire class and give more power to the people who have the least in our world. We need to delve further into this deal and these subsidies and programs. We need to challenge Amazon and the mayor and governor on its cooperation with ICE. We need to know why Amazon is opposed to allowing Amazon workers to join a union. We've got to rethink how we structure economic development deals. Amazon is apparently spending millions of dollars on flyers, these flyers. My advice to you, on behalf of my constituents, stop sending them. They are not working. Opposition is growing. <laughs> You have millions of dollars to waste, unlike working and poor people in the city of New York. But save the trees, stop selling them. We're not interested in this Amazon BS. The speaker agrees. So, um, <laughs> uh, I've got so many questions, but I want you to know I've got a lot more fight. I would also let you know that by at least two to one, my constituents have called me not to say to support the project, as you say, they must tell me, but instead to tell me to keep fighting you and to keep fighting this deal, which I will. Now, the mayor has said he's going to go across the country and spread the gospel of progressive values, his words. But I believe it is this record-breaking act of corporate welfare that will define his mayoralty. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Van Bremer. I got three of them as well, just to let you know. And I'm in a, I'm in a district over from you. So anyway, um, we will now hear from uh, James Patchett, President and CEO of the City's Economic Development Corporation, as well as Senior Vice President Lydia Downing, and Brian Usman, Holly Sullivan, and R. Dean Williams of Amazon after they are sworn in by Council. 
I'm sorry, I also want to introduce other council members who have joined us. Council member Francisco Moya, council member Robert Cornegy, council member Rory Lanceman, council member Andy Cohen are also here, okay. And council member Powers, uh, Cumbo, and Rosenthal. <coughs> Do you affirm that your testimony will be truthful to the best of your knowledge, information, and belief? I do. Thank you. Good morning, Speaker Johnson, Chair Drum, and members of the Finance Committee. I am James Patchett, President and CEO of the New York City Economic Development Corporation, known as EDC. We're responsible for driving and shaping economic growth across the five boroughs. EDC, in conjunction with our state counterpart, Empire State Development, is proud to have spearheaded the bid to bring Amazon's new headquarters to our city. I am here today to discuss why Amazon coming to New York is a victory for every one of the city's 8.6 million residents. Even though New York City did not give Amazon a single discretionary dollar to move here, not one, Discretionary incentives are offered to businesses on a case-by-case -case basis when a company is expected to have an outsized impact on the local economy. Most cities uh, would have seen it as totally reasonable to offer them, and did, but we chose not to. We held firm on our stance and yet still secured the largest economic development opportunity in New York State history. This opportunity will put tens of thousands of New Yorkers to work and dramatically increase our annual tax revenue which can help shore up our schools, libraries, transit, and infrastructure. Cities work best when everyone is working, and that's exactly what Amazon promises New Yorkers today. By further diversifying the economy and providing a reliable financial anchor, the new headquarters will help safeguard New York against future recessions and secure the resources we need to keep spearheading progressive change. All told, Amazon's new headquarters is expected to, live, to deliver nearly $30 billion in tax revenue to the city and state, including more than $13.5 billion to the city alone. For New Yorkers, the exponential return on investment, putting in zero discretionary benefits and getting over $13.5 billion in return, will have a profound ripple effect. Whether they live in Hunts Point or New Brighton, Laurelton, Sunset Park, or East Harlem, New Yorkers will benefit from this opportunity. This project is a model of what responsible and effective governments do. Take the long view and make decisions that do the most good for the greatest number of people. I appreciate the chance to discuss the incredible return New York City will get from Amazon and how the company will help protect our economic future. I will also speak to how this opportunity will create new job and workforce development programs, as well as spark unprecedented investments in infrastructure in Long Island City. Following my testimony, I will be happy to answer any questions. In November of 2018, Amazon announced it had selected Long Island City for its new headquarters. As mentioned, this is the single biggest job creation opportunity in New York State history, one that will create up to 40,000 jobs over the next 15 years. While I will discuss the extraordinary fiscal impact of the agreement later this morning, the most important benefit Amazon brings New Yorkers is economic security. Today, there is no question that the city's economy is thriving. Unemployment is at a record low, and job creation is at a record high. If New York were a country, we would be among the 20 largest national economies in the world, just below Spain's and Canada's. This success is remarkable, and we should be proud of it. We as a city have worked hard at it for years, but we know that it won't last forever. In recent decades, the city has managed to weather a number of downturns and recessions. Some have been short and some have been long, but all have adversely impacted New Yorkers. I am sure many in this room remember the tough times, like in 1992, when unemployment hovered close to 12%, or in 2003, when the war in Iraq was looming and the city was losing jobs, all while we struggled to regain footing after the most catastrophic event in our city's history. Certainly, everyone here remembers the 2008 recession, when the collapse of Lehman Brothers, a Wall Street anchor and major city employer, catalyzed the worst economic crisis since the Great Depression. Let me be clear. Despite our, our current economic health, today, there are many New Yorkers that still feel the effects of the financial crisis. In fact, we still feel the effects of the 1970s fiscal crisis, the aftermath of which devastated our public hospitals and schools. We know that the best time to protect a city against future recessions is before one happens. 
and that time is now. By strengthening our tech sector and diversifying our economy, we are cushioning the city against slumps that we know will come. In addition to diversifying the economy, Amazon is the jobs and income generator New York needs to remain a model 21st century city. From a jobs perspective, the Amazon opportunity will help real people in concrete ways. From the small business owner who will see an increase in foot traffic at her bodega, to the construction worker who will increase, who will help build the headquarters, to the computer, CUNY computer science student who will land a life-changing internship at the company, it is clear that this deal is about New Yorkers front and center. From this vantage point, Folks, if I could just ask the people to give them respect and to, uh, rather than applaud, go like this, but let's give everybody respect today. I'd appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. From this vantage point, it's virtually impossible to conceptualize the impact of these tens of thousands of new jobs. But in the not-so-distant future, tens of thousands of real New Yorkers will be working in these jobs. They could be your constituents, their children, or their grandchildren. Moreover, the billions in, tax, billions in tax revenue will pay tremendous dividends to our public institutions. With this windfall, the city will be able to hire more police officers, build more schools, and improve social services like medical care and disability assistance. What can more than $13.5 billion of additional tax revenue support here in our city? To put this figure in perspective, this could pay for every single three-year-old in the city to attend 3K for All for the next 16 years. Or that revenue could support 289,000 units of affordable housing. What about if we use that revenue to hire 5,600 new public school teachers with a bachelor's degree to work for the next 25 years? Or to employ 6,300 firefighters for the next quarter century? Think for a, magnitude, for a moment about the magnitude of that. With this additional revenue, some of our boldest, most progressive ideals can become policies, and our greatest needs are more likely to be met. We are looking forward and planning ahead, just like governments are supposed to do. And to effectively plan ahead, the city needed a sound methodology to calculate additional tax revenue that Amazon will generate. To create this, we first looked at the benefits associated with building Amazon's new headquarters from the ground up. Amazon is expected to invest a total of $3.6 billion into Long Island City from 2020 through 2029. We estimated that the combined fiscal impact associated with this build-out will be $263 million. Second, we looked at the benefits associated with Amazon's permanent operations in Long Island City. The estimated 40,000 jobs Amazon is projected to create in Long Island City are expected to bring in $9.2 billion in tax revenue to New York City. This includes business and personal income and sales and use taxes, as well as non-commercial property taxes and other miscellaneous non-property taxes. And these jobs will have a multiplier effect throughout New York City's economy, resulting in an estimated $5.1 billion in direct and induced impacts. And finally, we looked at the property tax Amazon will have to pay annually. Amazon will make payments in lieu of taxes as part of the development of the new headquarters. The pilot value will be equal to the company's estimated real property tax value, reduced by the estimated value of the state's ICAP abatement. Property taxes for the future headquarters were estimated using the Department of Finance's real property tax assessment guidelines for fiscal year 2019. Real property taxes that New York City currently collects on the development sites were also estimated from DOF's publicly available data. The future pilot revenue on redeveloped sites was discounted for current property tax collections in order to reflect only the incremental revenue to New York City. This is estimated to be $963 million. The fact that the city will generate more than $13.5 billion without offering a single discretionary dollar is truly unprecedented. With Amazon and Long Island City, our economic forecasts look far brighter. And so too do the futures of New Yorkers who will be trained for the jobs of tomorrow. In addition to ensuring our financial houses in order, workforce development is pivotal to ensuring the city's economic foundation is solid. Right now, we are working to ensure people of all backgrounds have an entry point into the high-wage, high-growth tech sector. And we are making an especially targeted effort to reach communities 
that have been previously excluded from economic booms and the tech sector as a whole. During the bidding process, we connected Amazon to some of the city's most inclusive workforce development providers. Amazon also met with representatives from CUNY and SUNY to learn how talent pipelines can be built from, colleges campus, from college campuses to the Long Island City headquarters. It's important to remember that our CUNY and SUNY schools are the best ladders to the middle class that we have, especially for immigrants and first-generation college students. For these kids, a job at Amazon doesn't just impact their own future, it impacts the future of their whole family. And we are not waiting for Amazon to put shovels in the ground to start working on our workforce development commitments. Just this week, we released a public proposal to provide grants to qualified workforce organizations interested in creating proven innovative ideas in training and career readiness programs that will help inform the city's workforce investments. With these programs, New Yorkers of all backgrounds will be prepared for the in-demand jobs that companies like Amazon and Google need to fill. This builds upon the millions of dollars the city, state, and Amazon will invest into new training programs specifically designed to give underrepresented New Yorkers the tools that they need to thrive. We are also launching new initiatives at Queensbridge Houses, starting with expanding the city's successful Jobs Plus program. Queensbridge residents will be Amazon's next door neighbors, and we know it's imperative that they directly benefit from this incredible opportunity. But Queensbridge isn't the only NYCHA development that will be getting new investments. The city will also invest, invest millions to launch a new program to train NYCHA residents across the boroughs for careers in IT, cybersecurity, and web development. As the head of the Economic Development Corporation, I have a responsibility to make sure that the city inherited by the next generation is even more and secure and resilient than it is today. We have an obligation to set them up for success, which is exactly what the Amazon deal does. This agreement makes it all but certain that our financial bedrock will be stronger tomorrow than it is today. And a stronger economic bedrock means a better quality of life for New Yorkers like Monahill Gohar, an 11th grader at the Business Technology Early College High School in Queens Village. She is a first-generation American and will be the first person in her family to go to college. She wants to be a mechanical engineer. For her, Amazon coming to Queens opens up a world of new engineering opportunities. Amazon is one of the most successful companies in the world with some of the smartest employees, she wrote in the Daily News. And with its incredible resources, it can make the road for other firsts like me much easier to travel. I have no doubt that the Amazon project will open new doors that lead to better futures for 8.6 million New Yorkers. It will pay boundless dividends that will help people like Monahill and countless other New Yorkers go farther, reach higher, and succeed in a 21st century economy. Thank you, and I look forward to taking questions. I'm also joined by my colleagues from the Department of Finance if you have questions about the specific programs. Thank you. Thank you, Speaker Johnson, Chair Drum, City Council Member Van Bramer, and members of the City Council for inviting us here today. I am Brian Huseman, Vice President of Public Policy at Amazon, and I'm joined here at the table by Ardeen Williams, who is our Vice President of Human Resources, and Holly Sullivan, our Head of Worldwide Economic Development. And while you all know Holly, Ardeen is the leader of our new headquarters, Workforce Development and Recruiting, and she brings a wealth of experience to this role after serving as a captain in the U.S. Army. And she also built Amazon's apprenticeship programs that train veterans uh, transi transitioning to the private sector for tech roles at Amazon. <coughs> And first, I'd like to discuss our existing presence in New York City and state. Amazon has over 8,000 employees in the state and over 5,000 employees in New York City. And these employees work in areas across the company, including corporate employees working in retail, web services, advertising, and fashion, as well as our fulfillment center associates working in our new facility in Staten Island. And I'm joined today by a number of my fellow Amazon employees. We call ourselves Amazonians. Uh, and Amazon is a company with over 250,000 employees in the US focused on innovating for our customers. And I'm very proud to work with such a talented group of people, and I'm excited for you to meet some of them. <clears throat> so with us today are associates from our Staten Island. <clears throat> uh, folks, folks, shh. Hey, 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 hey. Excuse me, excuse me, excuse me, excuse me. Hello, excuse me. Thank you. 
So we appreciate the fact <clears throat> that you're here, and we of course want to have this hearing. We can't have interruptions like that. People are fine to hold up the signs that you're holding in your seats, totally fine. But we, if we're going to have this hearing, we need to be able to listen to the folks that came here to testify today and ask uh, the questions that council members mm -hmm. need answered. So if it happens again, and I don't want it to happen again, we are going to have to remove folks. I don't want that to happen. I want everyone to be here. So again, if you, you can hold the signs, totally fine. But I just want to make sure that we can actually have a hearing today where we can ask uh, the questions that council members need to ask. So thank you. I appreciate you being here. Uh, Mr. Hussman, if you want to continue with your testimony. Yes, with us today are associates from our Staten Island Fulfillment Center, and at this facility we provide access to our innovative education program. Uh, we called career... Oh sir, sir, uh, sir, if you, if you, if you could uh, escort this gentleman out. If you could escort that gentleman out, please. So if it happens again, if another individual does it, we're going to clear the entire balcony because we have to have a hearing. So you can stay and listen and hold the signs, but if it happens again, we're going to remove the whole balcony. You can continue, sir. At our Stein Island Fulfillment Center, we have our innovative program called Career Choice, which we prepay tuition for in-demand and high-paying uh, jobs. Uh, just a few of the, my uh, fellow employees here, if you just want to uh, kind of uh, you know, introduce yourself. Uh, George works there as an area manager and a learning ambassador, and he's originally from Staten Island, but he lives in Brooklyn now. And Travis previously worked at a fulfillment center in New Jersey before transferring, and he works in quality control and with our Amazon robotics drives. Uh, Justin recently relocated to our Staten Island facility this past summer, and he supports employee engagement across the site. Uh, Shay, who lives in Brooklyn, recently graduated from the University of Connecticut before joining our team. And Matthew recently retired from a career in professional baseball and returned home to Staten Island working to pick and pack our customer orders. Uh, Allison has been with Amazon over five years. She works in our Hudson Yards office with Amazon Advertising. She leads the New York City chapter of Connect at Amazon, which is a global employee networking organization driving community engagement and volunteering opportunities for Amazonians. And I know I've missed a few, but thank you all uh, for joining me. There are more uh, than, there are just a few of the more than 5,000 existing employees employees we have in New York City, and we look forward to having them join the employees we're going to begin hiring in the city. Amazon's investment in Long Island City will create 25,000 new jobs over 10 years with an average annual salary of more than $150,000. And those jobs come with full benefits, health care, dental care, generous parental leave, job training, retirement savings, and more. There are going to be jobs in engineering, sales, marketing, and operation. And our development is going to create jobs in building and construction, building management, and hospitality. So there are going to be jobs at all skills and all education levels. The new headquarters will generate more than $27 billion in new tax revenues for the city and state. And if Amazon does not come here, there is no $27 billion, and there aren't those 25,000 jobs. And that $27 billion could be reinvested to improve New York's subways and buses, build more affordable housing, or for health care expansion. These jobs are good for Long Island City, good for Queens, and good for New York. Now, we were invited to come to New York, and we want to invest in a, in a community that wants us. And that's why we're excited to announce several new developments since we were last before the City Council. First, we begin outreach to small businesses with whom we would partner and who would benefit from our employee base in Long Island City. Now, unlike other companies, Amazon doesn't offer free catered food to our employees. And in fact, our in-house food retail was purposefully designed to only feed one third of our employees so we can push <clears throat> our employees into the neighborhood for lunch, coffee, or dinner, so push those dollars into the local economy and benefit neighborhood businesses. The space we do have for food retail is typically first floor retail, and we work hard to recruit and foster locally owned businesses in those spaces. So for example, each Amazon office building leases space to just a few local restaurants, and we purposefully choose to work with local restaurateurs. And we are already working and partnering with the local business community. It's clear to us that the local business community is excited about the opportunities and jobs that Amazon's new investment will bring into the community. And one example is Donna Drimmer, who owns a small business in Long Island City called Matted LIC. And she started her business in 2009, selling contemporary art and photography, framing jewelry and artisanal items. And in a recent press report, she said, quote, 
The truth of the matter is I've been 110% behind this project since it was announced in November. After a recent roundtable we held for small business owners in Long Island City, she said that Amazon, quote, really wanted to hear our issues, and they want to be a part of the community and not a plague on it. Yes, they will have 25,000 employees who will be out on the streets, and hopefully they will come into my shop and make purchases. And Donna, we very much look forward to working with you and your fellow small business owners. <clears throat> We believe our new headquarters should provide job opportunities for all New Yorkers. And today we are announcing that we are beginning a program to hire NYCHA residents for jobs in our award-winning customer service department. This pro program is not only good for Long Island City and NYCHA residents, but is good for Amazon, and we're excited to access this terrific talent pool. We will begin accepting applications next quarter, and we look forward to working with the Community Advisory Committee for Workforce Development and the Tenant Association Presidents of Queensbridge, Ravenswood, Woodside, and Astoria Houses to define and build a successful program. Next, we believe that young people from all backgrounds should have the help they need, from childhood to career, to access highly paid, rapidly growing careers in computer science. And computer science courses should be available in every classroom, in every school in the country. Amazon Future Engineer, or AFE, is our comprehensive childhood to career program designed to educate and train children and young adults from low-income communities to pursue careers in computer science. We aim to fund computer science courses for underprivileged young people across the US and to award students from these communities pursuing degrees in computer science with four-year $10,000 annual scholarships as well as internships at Amazon to gain work experience. Yesterday, we announced that we have enrolled more than 130 New York City high schools in our Amazon Future Engineer program. That means that one in every six New York City high schools is receiving funding and programs for computer science education through AFE. And that's one in every four high schools in Queen, Queens. Over two thirds of our participating New York City high schools are Title I high schools. And applications are still coming in from new schools across the New York City area. Amazon is delivering access to computer science education for thousands of New York City high school students, and we're just getting started. And this is just one of the ways we are working with the community to ensure that there's a pipeline of young people who will have the skills and education to work for Amazon or any tech company they choose. Uh, and if any members uh, of the council, if you have a high school in your district that is interested in participating in the Amazon Future Engineer Program, my team can follow up with you uh, right after this to help facilitate that application process. Uh, next, cloud computing is widely considered the biggest growth area in technology jobs today, and it's been ranked as one of the most in-demand skills over the past few years. Amazon Web Services, or AWS, through its AWS Educate program, provides a workforce development and training program that creates a foundational base in cloud computing technologies for careers in the field at Amazon or elsewhere. AWS Educate provides hands-on experience with cloud technology and tools, including instructional content and activities, no-cost access to the AWS cloud for hands-on project-based learning, and AWS Educate's vast listing of jobs and internships in the cloud industry. I'm pleased to announce today that we've teamed up with LaGuardia Community College, the City University of New York, and the State University of New York to launch a pathway to employment in cloud computing jobs with a new cloud computing certificate program. This program will help students across New York learn skills for entry-level tech roles, whether at Amazon or other tech companies. This initiative will start in LaGuardia Community College this fall, and we plan to continue to work with these partners to enable thousands of New York students the opportunity to land entry-level tech roles in the New York cloud computing industry. And our partnership with LaGuardia, CUNY, and SUNY will help ensure that even more students have the opportunity to join companies here in New York City like Amazon as we seek out more tech talent. And it's really just the beginning of our workforce development efforts in New York. We're looking forward to launching more initiatives to meet New Yorkers where they are and providing opportunities for new skill sets and even better paying jobs. In conclusion, we've been a part of New York and New York City for years. With over 5,000 employees currently working here, we will continue to work with community partners to build plans for small business development, jobs for NYCHA residents, computer science education, and workforce development programs. But we want to invest and be a part of the growth of a community where our employees and our companies are welcome. And we believe 
that New Yorkers agree that 25,000 new jobs in Long Island City and $27 billion in new revenue for the state and city to spend on the community's priorities is good for this city. Thank you for the opportunity to be here today, and I look forward to your questions. Uh, thank you. Where did you get that $27 billion number that you keep citing? It's the, it's, the, it's the city plus. No, no, plus I was the, asking I'm Amazon. Sorry. I thought. Where you, Mr. Hussman, you keep citing a $27 billion number. You did it in the previous hearing as well. I want to know where you got that number. The city and the state released an economic impact study. Um, who who for paid for that study? I'm not, I'm not aware of that information. Well, if you're citing not, a study of $27 billion, we should know who paid for the study. I believe the city and the state paid for that study, and the city and state negotiated this deal. It's not an independent study. So there have been independent studies that have come out in the last couple of months, and those independent studies have not been in line with the number that's keep, that keeps being repeated here today, which is the nine to one return and $27 billion. So I think it's important that at the outset of this hearing, we establish the facts. We establish the facts related to who conducted that study, who paid for that study, is there a lot of agreement on that study, and if we're gonna operate off of certain numbers, I think we should operate factually off those numbers, and I think it's important that we start uh, the hearing uh, today in that regard. So I wanna, I wanna, uh, uh, just uh, start to go through. If we could bring up the model on the screen. So this looks very confusing, <laughs> but it's actually very important, and it's likely what the study that you're, that you're citing should have looked at. But the study that you're citing did not look at this. So I'm gonna quickly bring you through this, because this should be the basis of what we talk about when we talk about economic development, when we talk about opportunity cost, when we talk about displacement of businesses and housing costs and all these things. So we have, of course, repeatedly heard numbers from the administration and from Amazon defending the deal and saying it will generate $27 billion and it will have a nine to one benefit cost ratio that the deal will pay for itself. However, while these estimates, which come from EDC and ESD, do a really good job at looking at the benefits of Amazon coming to town, the cost side of the analysis is not part of the study that you released. So let's talk about that. If you look at the screen, there is a simplified version of a comprehensive economic model that should be used to evaluate the costs and benefits of an economic development deal such as this one. So you can see what I believe we should be considering. Number one, the opportunity cost. The land that Amazon is building on was slated for two public schools, 5,000 units of affordable housing, sorry, 5,000 units of housing, 1,250 units of affordable housing, and a number of commercial spaces. Was the question asked as part of this analysis that keeps getting cited, are we better off with Amazon on this site than what it was slated for? Number two, unaffected decisions. Research shows that between 3.4% and 23.4% of investment, any investment, that receives a tax incentive are actually motivated by the investment. So sometimes it's 3% are motivated by the investment, sometimes it's up to 23%. We need to consider how many of these jobs would have come here even without these financial incentives. That wasn't looked at in the study. Displacement of businesses. The subsidies will give Amazon a competitive advantage over other businesses in the city, other small businesses in the area, and it will raise the cost for their existing New York City competitors, potentially leading to competitors having to downsize. Why subsidize one company over another? That goes into the conversation we have to have about monopolies and about gaining too much market share. A multiplier, a, mu a multiplier effect. Amazon hires people, those people spend money, and that creates a positive indirect effect in terms of more jobs, higher wages, and increased tax revenue. That's what you all keep citing, what I just read. That's a benefit, so the administration did do a good job in looking at those potential benefits. But ESD estimates that the deal will lead to an additional 130,000 people coming to New York City. That's what the study said. What are the costs, both capital and expense, of providing these services 
to new residents? Is the extra revenue enough to cover those costs? Is it enough to cover costs for new schools, for more subway service, for infrastructure? And then other economic effects. An influx of workers and their families is going to mean higher housing costs for residents and higher rents for local businesses. That may be good for property owners who will see their values increase, but what does that mean for renters, people who are not wealthy, who are living in the neighborhood? Will some households and businesses be worse off? As far as we know, from the study that keeps being cited of $27 billion and a nine to one return that was paid for by the city and the state, as far as we know, that comprehensive analysis was not taken into account. So, uh, Mr. Patchett, President Patchett, if you could tell me, is that correct? In the study that keeps being cited, those factors that I just laid out, was that looked at in the city and state commission study? Um, Mr. Speaker, it's the, you know, it's, this, it's the government's job to plan for growth and provide services to our citizens. We've added over 400,000 jobs since 2014, and we added over 100,000 people between 2014 and 2017. The numbers you're citing are correct, although this, you're, I think you're roughly referencing a state population number. But regardless, we're talking about an annual change in population of four to 5,000 people. Uh, again, we, the city added more than 100,000 people between 2014 and 2017. If we can't manage a population change of a few thousand people in a city of 8.6 million, then this, the government isn't doing its basic job, which is to provide services to all of our citizens. Did you look at the costs that I mentioned <clears throat> uh, in the study? Were costs looked at or just benefits? As we always do, we'll be conducting a comprehensive economic impact analysis or environmental we'll impact analysis, which will be looking at these issues as so we So it hasn't do. been done yet. We announced a deal and we're celebrating a deal before the city looked at the costs of the deal. Uh, we, we looked at all of those factors. Okay, where, where? Where's the document that shows me you looked at that? Well, as, as you're aware, we set aside $650 million in funding from the deal for infrastructure costs to be addressed uh, in the, uh, at, that will come up over the course of this transaction, and we're working closely with the community, specifically the infrastructure. The study that was commissioned, where does it talk about the costs associated that I outlined? Does um, it talk about the costs or no? It just talks about benefits, is that correct? Uh, it talks about some costs and some benefits. Can you please, can you please, can you, can you please share with me what the impact will be on the housing market, on the subways, on the need for firehouses, mm -hmm and on the need for more schools. Your initial analysis, can you tell me the impact on those things? So, as, as you know, as you, as you cited, the, these previous sites were planned to be just over 5,000 units of housing, um, as well as the other components that you mentioned, the commercial space, the schools, uh, and parks, other things. What we did as a part of this agreement was we effectively swapped what was going to be a plan for housing for a plan for commercial space. And that was in response to what was the single overriding concern from members of the community, which was that they were excited about the open space, they were excited about the schools, they were excited about the commercial space, but they were concerned about the housing and the, its impacts on the infrastructure. So we believe that this will be a m lower impact on infrastructure in Long Island City because it's complementary to existing infrastructure. What research do you have to back that up? Uh, we will be doing a comprehensive you will environmental impact. You haven't done it yet. As, I, as you know, as you pointed out, it's important to work with the community to identify the specific infrastructure. But that's needs. typically what ULERP is for. Yep, you go through a process to actually work with the community and to negotiate something. Instead, you are cutting out the formal review process and saying that you yourselves will work with the community, cutting out the process that's been set up for half a century that's used to work with the community. Well, as, so, as, as you know, there's a, there are, is a state process that's been used for a number of projects. That's the general project plan process. It includes a comprehensive- yes, that's a future hearing. Okay. That's the next hearing we're gonna have you were just to talk about that. Okay, I wanna move on uh, to uh, some other things. Mr. Houseman, you mentioned that there are 5,000 uh, employees that are currently working uh, here in New York City for Amazon, is that correct? Yes. How many of those employees are unionized? None, sir. None. 
Do you, uh, are you, uh, would you be open? I asked this at the previous hearing and I didn't get a straight answer. Uh, as, as since you're getting potentially over $3 billion in some level of incentive or direct subsidy from the city and the state, indirect or direct, uh, would you agree to uh, neutrality if workers at Amazon wanted to unionize? Uh, speaker, just uh, to clarify, the incentives are a post-performance. We only uh, receive uh, those incentives after we create the jobs, after we maintain the jobs. And after I understand that. Would you would you be, be okay with agreeing that. to neutrality so that workers can unionize? No, sir. We respect and You wouldn't agree to that? Uh, correct, sir. We would not. Does the de Blasio administration feel comfortable with Amazon not agreeing to be neutral as it relates to uh, organizing uh, people if they want to be unionized? Um, you know, first and foremost, you know the mayor is an enormous supporter of, of union rights in this city. So you disagree with Amazon's position that they just stated? We, as, as you're aware, this is, a, this is a conversation about the Amazon's headquarters. As a part of that conversation, we worked out an agreement with the company to work for the first time with a historic agreement with the building service workers. Not all, well we, not all unions. You picked a couple of unions. So some we workers picked, were valued and other workers were not valued. We, we focused so on the unions. So you're pitting some workers against other workers which isn't right. So do you agree with what Mr. Houseman just said about um, making, not supporting neutrality? Uh, Mr. S Mr. Speaker, I just, if I could finish the point. We focused on the jobs at the site that we were discussing with the company, which was the headquarters site, and we emphasized to them repeatedly that it was critical that they work with the unions that were relevant for that site. Did, on you, top ask of for, did you ask for neutrality? Was that part of the negotiation? Neutrality at the headquarters location? Neutrality for any of the jobs that are being created here in New York City, did you ask for neutrality so that workers could unionize? What we was, that, was that part of any negotiation? What we emphasized to them that this, that this union rights were critical to us and that we have very strong laws in the city and that the Department of Consumer Affairs and Worker Protection. So did you ask for neutrality or not ask for neutrality? We discussed our expectations did that they would work with unions. Did you ask for neutrality or not ask for neutrality? It sounds like you didn't. We asked for union deals. That's not neutrality. Okay, thank you for answering the question. So um, I want to I want to get back to some of the the uh, the need for financial incentives. Oh, I have a question. Any of uh, Mr. Hausman, any of those five thousand jobs are any of those people working on programs associated with uh, the the work that Amazon does with ICE? Speaker, I'm going to uh, clarify uh, the discussion um, in the last situation since you're bringing uh, this up. Uh, the immigration policy in this country is a very serious issue that deserves scrutiny and deserves uh, national attention. Amazon has a strong record on immigration rights. We have fought the Trump travel ban. We have litigated for DACA Shh. reforms. We have lobbied for dreamer protections and lobbied for green card reforms. I'm very proud of the record that we have on immigration issues. But do you know that ICE uses some of your, uh, your software to round up and deport people? Speaker, are you, you comfortable with that? Speaker, you are. That is not. Uh, That's what, not accurate. That, we have not, we, that is not what we have said. We cannot disclose who our customers or our potential customers are without their permission. I want to talk about this technology that you're that you're referring to you and like step to back about what it is and what it is not. This technology is a mathematical matching algorithm that helps match images that are in a customer's database, and it has very it has very beneficial uses in child sexual exploitation and child kidnapping. For example, Thorn, which is a nonprofit that fights child sexual abuse, has said, and they've talked about how with their use of the recognition technology, they've been able to cut down their investigation time by 65%, which has helped them in over 100 cases. So you feel this totally comfortable with how benefits. you feel totally comfortable with how ICE uses uh, how ICE uses what your work with them. Again, uh, Speaker, we're not uh, able to talk about who our customers or potential customers are without their permission. But I do want to talk about the strict uh, policy. That we you have, just talked uh, in about place. the work you do with them <laughs> 10 seconds ago. So we're going to talk about the strict uh, policies speak. that we have in place. In order to use this technology, uh, customers must ag agree to our terms. And our terms prohibit 
any customers from using this technology for illegal conduct. And so that if they violate that, would of you cancel civil the contract? Or, that includes violations of civil or constitutional rights. And if any customer, business or government, violates civil or constitutional rights using this technology, we will, we will absolutely terminate that relationship. Okay, so if I get you some examples of ICE doing that after this hearing, if they are a potential customer, since you won't say they're a customer, even though we know they're a customer, you'll potentially cancel the contract? Again, Speaker, I will not talk about who our customers or potential customers are. <laughs> However, if we receive any complaints at all about any illegal conduct, and that includes violation of civil or constitutional rights through the use of our technology, we will absolutely terminate that relationship and prohibit anyone from using that technology. Forgive me for being skeptical. Amazon said repeatedly at the last hearing that the city's talent pool was the main driver of why they chose to come here. That's what you said. However, yes, a look at the RFP you put out for HQ2 reveals that something else was also significant. A full third of the requests for information in the RFP were about financial incentives. We analyzed it. Incentives that Amazon could receive from the responding state or municipality. Only one question was about the labor pool in the RFP that we analyzed. So would you have come to Long Island City if you weren't going to receive $3 billion in taxpayer money? No, as we previously um, said in our previous testimony, labor was the primary driver. Um, the cost of doing business and looking at the financial overall financial impact was also part of our decision-making process. Would you have come here without the $3 billion? It's hard to deal in hypotheticals, um, but uh, I would say that the incentives were an important part of that. You, you read the RFP, you've probably seen the RFI also. There are many questions about the cost of doing business in the city and the state, and the incentives are a tool in our toolbox to allow us to reinvest in our facilities and our employees. Again, I just want to ask, what is the current uh, public valuation of Amazon as a company? It's valued at what, about a trillion dollars? I don't know the exact figure. It's uh, lower than that. It's close to a trillion dollars, though, right? It's something like that. Something yes, like sir. that. Yeah. And uh, the, the founder and, and uh, CEO of the company, Mr. Bezos, is uh, approximately worth about 150 to $160 billion? I'm not sure, sir. But that's what you've read as well, right? Uh, it's something in that range. Yeah, something in that range. Yeah. So, so, so again, I asked this at the first hearing, why do you need our money? We have 63,000 people sleeping in a homeless shelter tonight in New York City. We have subways that are falling apart. We have schools that aren't getting the money they deserve. We have public housing that is crumbling around us, not far from where Amazon wants to locate. Don't you think there's a better way for us to spend $3 billion than give it to your company, which is worth a trillion dollars, and the founder of your company, which is the richest man in the world? Is there a better way to potentially spend the money? This seems like vulture, monopolistic capitalism at its worst. We are, you know, our focus is on creating the 25,000 jobs and investing over $3 billion in your city. And we look forward to you spending the revenues generated from our project, which have been estimated by a city and state study of over $27 billion. And Speaker, I just must respectfully disagree with that characterization of this. We are about creating jobs here in Long Island City and New York City. These are good jobs. It will pay an average of $150,000. We are in favor of the positive economic impact this project will bring to this city. Well, well, the people in Seattle don't agree with that and how they felt they've been treated by you all. So you can say that here today before you're here, but city council members from Seattle traveled to New York City to warn us about your deceptive practices, promises that you make and break, and how you swallow up small businesses, how you attempt to water down local legislation, how you lobby local government, municipal government for your own means. So if we look at what you've done in Seattle, it doesn't add up to what you're doing here today. And you are in a union city, this is a city that was built by unions, a city that loves unions, a city that has the highest per capita of union jobs in the entire United States. And one of the first answers to your question today is, would you be neutral? You said no. That is not a way to come to our city, a city where 20% of people are living at or below the poverty line. So respectfully, that's not respect. We are living in a time and a society with huge economic inequality 
with people like Mr. Bezos living at the top of the food chain, with Amazon being worth almost a trillion dollars, and you have homeless people across the United States of America. You have people that are going hungry at night. You have public housing that is crumbling, and you don't support good union jobs. You're taking $3 billion in our money. So, Mr. Houseman, when you say respectfully, that is not the experience that policymakers and elected officials have had in the city of Seattle. Speaker Johnson, if I could respond to a part of that um, comment that you just made. So we're, we're focused on our headquarter project, which will again create the 25,000 jobs, invest over $3 billion. And as Mr. Patchett said um, here just a few moments ago, we're focused on working with the unions on that project. We have already had relationships with the trade unions. We're already committed to using 32 BJ. So for this project, we are in fact committed to working with the unions. How come you, okay, if you want to talk about that again, how come you won't agree to neutrality then? What's the reason why you won't agree to neutrality? Speaker, we respect an employee's right to choose to join or to not join a union. We do firmly believe that the direct connection that we have between our employees and the open door policy is the most effective way to respond to the concerns of the workforce. So the strategy of extracting subsidies from local governments have been a longstanding uh, element of Amazon's development strategy. The estimated to total value of state and local subsidies awarded to Amazon and its subsidiaries is about $1.6 billion, exclusive of what you stand to receive from the HQ2 deals. Experts across multiple fields have said, quote, the use of Amazon's market power to extract incentives from local and state governments is rent-seeking and anti-competitive and it is against the public interest for cities and states to participate in that. So, Mr. Patchett, what is EDC and the administration's view of these type of contests? Should New York City continue to engage in contests like this in the future? We don't engage in, cont in contests like this, and we didn't in this circumstance. What we did was provide zero dollars of uh, incentives to the company. The the fact that they're eligible for existing state law programs uh, which incentivize commercial development in the outer boroughs, it's true for this company, it's true for any other company that would have gone to these locations. The city promised them no financial incentives as a part of this agreement. And, I, and the, the reason the city has taken that position is consistent with your point, which is that you know, I agree with the concerns of economists that it is, can be a race to the bottom, and there probably should be federal laws that preclude uh, companies from being able to pit cities against one another. And that's why, first and foremost— Isn't that what Amazon did here? It, that's why, first and foremost, New York City has a, a tax rate corporate tax rate of almost 9% just in New York City, which is by far the highest municipal tax rate of, of any large city in the country. And that is on top of the 6.5% corporate tax rate for the state of New York. I mean, I think if you look at any of the competitor cities, we have dramatically higher tax rates for companies, and that is why we're able to generate the significant revenues here, which will be able to invest in infrastructure and other important public services. James, do you have any misgivings about this deal? I feel very confident this is a good deal. Do you have any city. misgivings? I have no misgivings about what None. We <laughs> no, no misgivings. I, I, again, I think I'm very confident in the work. You don't that have we've a misgiving done. about what Mr. Houseman just said about not being neutral. Oh, okay. The administration doesn't have misgivings about that. Look, I have I have many concerns. I don't agree with Amazon's position on everything, without a doubt. Do you I have any misgivings about their work with ICE? If, if look, we as a city are a sanctuary city. You said it yourself. I agree with everything that you've said which is that this city has to support immigrants' rights. That's why we worked with you to pass a law to ensure that no city resources can be used to address these issues. Look, if, if in fact it's true and people's rights are being violated by software that's being- It sounds like you should have some misgivings, given what we know about Amazon. I'm gonna turn it back uh, to the chair to ask some questions, thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Um, as I mentioned in my opening, and as you can see from the screen, they're going to put up a, a chart in a minute. Uh, from your report, it appears that EDC's impact analysis, uh, you estimate the benefits of 40,000 new jobs at, and 8 million square feet, but for the estimating cost, you assume 25,000 jobs and 4 million square feet. 
Is this an accurate assessment of the evaluation that was done? And if so, uh, why was it done this way? And if not, please clarify how the estimates were calculated. Uh, it's, not actu it's not accurate. Uh, so what we did was we assumed uh, the 40, up to 40,000 jobs being built, uh, being hired by the company over, tw over 15 years. Um, and we assumed, assumed a full uh, ICAP abatement associated with the level of development that would be necessary for that. Um, and we assumed that the REAP program uh, would continue to exist for 10 years in its current form. So all right, let's just start with REAP then. The EDC estimates that this will be worth, uh, I think, $897 million. Is this based on an estimate of 25,000 or 40,000 jobs? Yeah, that's, that is based on an assumption of it being available for the next 10 years, which is approximately 25,000 jobs. So what is the estimate for 40,000 jobs? On a net present value basis, it would be about another $200 million. OK, let's uh, look at ICAP. Um, in press releases, the administration estimated the cost of Amazon's ICAP benefits at $386 million, but EDC reports estimates of about $618 million. Yeah. What accounts for the difference? And are those estimates based on 4 million square feet or 8 million square feet? Uh, so uh, and what would the estimate be for the number of not used? Sure. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. The, so the estimates we've reported, that EDC has put out and reported, have been the $618 million number that you referenced. That's based on 6.4 million square feet of development equivalent to 40,000 jobs. So then what's that 386 number? I'm, I'm not sure which one you're referring to. The number that we've been using is 618. The mayor cited it in the press release. Uh, I mean, th I think that it may be the number associated with the 25,000 jobs, but I mean, are the numbers we've been reporting on are the 40,000 jobs. All right, um, with pilots um, that will be paid on city-owned land, what is the value for the ICAP benefit? That was um, offered to Amazon on those parcels. Yeah, I just want to clarify something that you said in your opening statement. There's no additional benefit associated with that. There's not a discretionary benefit associated with that. What we've done is mimicked what actual taxes would be uh, on publicly owned parcels um, as, as the same, effectively the same taxes we paid on privately owned parcels. Um, so we've, there's no additional benefit associated with that. But, but the city could have offered to, to make them pay the whole tax. I mean, the, 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 I mean the, the rules of the way that we work with the Department of Finance is to mimic actual taxes uh, uh, using pilot structures. Um, in fact, in, in, anything... And so it's a choice. Well, no, anything other than that would actually be subject to legal challenge in our experience. Um. But it's also, th those numbers are captured within the the numbers that we uh, presented, that right, you so, re already so, referenced. So why did the city... Um, decide to retain ownership of those parcels of land? Uh, we think it's critically important that the city retain ownership so that we have uh, the authority to uh, take actions against the company and hold them responsible for their obligations uh, in the form of leases. I also think it's been the long-standing, it's certainly been my long-standing policy uh, in my time at EDC and frankly in my time working for the city that the city should never sell public land, that instead we should retain ownership of it so that ultimately the benefits of public land accrue back to the city. On the benefits side, what assumptions about the number of jobs and square footage were made in the $27, million, excuse me, excuse me, $27 billion estimate uh, and how would this number change if the assumptions changed? Well, it's based on the, the 40,000 jobs and the 6.4 million square feet that we were just discussing. All right. Um, in September 2015, the city most recently converted the Boundary Commission uh, for Industrial and Commercial Abatement Program. Mm -hmm. This commission is required to meet every five years to review and update special area boundaries, which determine the locations where deeper ICAP benefits are available. For that meeting, EDC recommended that the Boundary Commission vote to keep the existing boundaries in place so that they could be uh, considered as part of a comprehensive and holistic reform exercise of the entire suite of city-run commercial tax incentives. This would have included a review of REAP and ICAP, the two city benefits that Amazon will be receiving. 
the Boundary Commission was told that the reform exercise would be completed by the spring of, 18, of 16. Uh, more than three years after this commitment was made, the administration still has not conducted or produced any review of the city's tax incentives. Well, I think so, it, it, oh, sorry, go ahead. No, so why hasn't um, EDC completed the comprehensive review of the city's tax expenditures as promised, and has it even been started? Well, uh, Council Member, a few things about that. I mean, it actually goes to the underlying point, which is that these are both state law changes. So uh, I think the, the hope from the city's standpoint was that, that we could do that simultaneously with the ability to change the laws in Albany, uh, but in the interim, uh, all what do you mean by change it simultaneously? I mean, to, to make a comprehensive set of adjustments. These are all of these programs are dictated by state law. What was the review done? Uh, we, That's the question. Right. So we worked with the council on a review in 2016. Um, and I think we collectively have a series of recommendations about ways we would like to adjust these programs. Uh, and ultimately, the, 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 ultimately, the issue is um, who in the council did you work with on that? There was a, there was a, the council did a report in 2016 on uh, these city uh, these financial incentives, worked and worked with the city on it. I ha I'm happy to share a copy with you. We we understand it to have been a report in 2017 or 20 it may be 2017. Sorry, but still it was after you promised the comprehensive review. Okay. Yeah, and I, mean, I, think, I think right now, I think what your other, the other point is that this speaks to really is the need to pursue our um, overall comprehensive look at the property tax system. That's why we have the Joint Property Tax Commission right now. I mean, there's no question. There are all of these programs that layer on top but of one REAP another. REAP is not a property tax. It's a business tax. No, it's, it, no these are, what's that? REAP is, a, is not a property tax. Okay, sorry. That, uh, ICAP is, though, and I think that's the one that we have primarily, you were talking about ICAP in special areas, that's, th that is related to ICAP. Yeah, well, it was supposed to be, from our understanding, a total review of all city taxes. Okay, well, uh, I think we were, it was focused, the conversation was focused on ICAP at the time, but I'm happy to discuss it further. All right, so anyway, was the EDC's commitment to the Boundary Commission to conduct a review and acknowledgement that, that the city has a responsibility to assess whether these tax breaks are actually working. Yeah, it's the ultimate question that we're trying to get at here today. I, 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 think, the, the, I think the important point here um, is, 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 you're right, you're just making a distinction between the special areas which receive a longer term of abatement versus the, the other areas. This project is located not in a special area, so it's eligible for the lower level of benefit. So any, any adjustments that would have been made would have only, the only way in which it could have impacted this project was to give it more benefits. So uh, there are those who would say that you kept your head in the sand on this issue and that therefore now uh, Amazon is reaping the benefit of not having done that review. Uh, I mean, I just disagree with that characterization. As you know, these are programs that are subject to the legislature in Albany. This, the only way that the city can adjust, the only way the city could adjust the level of benefits available on the Amazon site would be to increase the duration of the benefits. Well, we the, have, the fact of the matter is still remains that you could have done the review and made recommendations and that wasn't done. Uh, we, we've certainly sought to make adjustments to these laws. Well, that would have had a big effect here. What the, well, again, we've, the, the, the challenge is, as you know, um, these are state laws, and they have been extended Nevertheless, without if you had done it, it past. still would have had an impact on this discussion whether or not it's a state law. We're happy to discuss it further. All right. If REAP and ICAP were discretionary, would you have provided them to Amazon? No. Okay. Um, so do you believe that these programs should be allowed to expire when their current legal authority <laughs> expires? I think they need to be looked at. Um, as you've pointed out, I think that the, 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 I think but that's kind of what we were just discussing. It, I, know, right? as, as, I know I'm agreeing with you. I think the, the point is though, fundamentally, the, the, first of all, ICAP provides benefits, as you know, um, in Manhattan, as well as across the city. Um, the fundamental point to me of both REAP and ICAP should be to ensure that we continue to incentivize job growth in the outer boroughs. I know you know this well, council member from Queens, um, the more than 70% of jobs that pay more than $150,000 a year are located in Manhattan. 
that's just in a, in a city that is striving to be the fairest in the, in the country, we just absolutely cannot, cannot allow that to continue to be the case. We have to have a more diverse city uh, economically from a geographic standpoint. It means that we have to continue to find a way to encourage employers to hire people outside of Manhattan in good paying jobs. That's the way these programs are, the, the way these programs are set up and what they're intended to accomplish. And that being said, notwithstanding the presence of both of these programs, I am not aware of a single large scale new office development um, that has happened without the city t playing a particular role to encourage it. So how do you know that REAP and ICAP are doing that? The point is they're not. They're, 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 they're not, even, even with those programs on the books, they're not having that effect. So why then haven't you recommended to the state um, for the changes? We, we have recommended changes to the state. When? Uh, in previous legislative sessions where they've been up for renewal, but they were ultimately extended with no changes. All right, we'll have to come back to that. I, you know, I was a former educator. I want to talk a little bit about schools, too. Absolutely. Yesterday, Amazon announced that it would be uh, funding computer science programs at 130 schools across the city. And actually, we just got a, um, a, a tweet from Marie Winfield on Twitter, and she wants to know how and by whom uh, will these schools be selected? Uh, who made the decision? Let the companies. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Um, we have, um, uh, we can provide you uh, information for how schools can apply for Amazon Future uh, Engineer uh, program. Uh, we're still uh, looking for more schools in the New York City area uh, to participate. Uh, I believe we have the exact application link on our the Amazon blog that we uh, posted yesterday where we announced that, and I'll make sure that it's, um, that we uh, respond uh, back uh, to Ms. Winfield. Will you that. prioritize high need schools? Absolutely, sir. More than half of these schools that are currently participating in New York City and Amazon Future Engineer are Title I no. schools, and we absolutely. Now, these schools are not going to actually be getting computers. That's just instruction on how to use the computers in the program. Yes, it's a variety of uh, things that we provide. We provide funding uh, for the curriculum, for teacher professional development. Uh, we have uh, on-call uh, tutors for that. So it's to provide the spread the funding and the curriculum so they can teach uh, computer science education. Okay, and let me ask also about the schools. The speaker touched on it a little bit, but it's a very important issue to me and also Councilman Van Bramer. Uh, district 30 is one of the most overcrowded school districts in the city, mm -hmm. uh, and it's right next door to District 24, which I think is the most mm -hmm. overcrowded school district in the city. In the School Constructions Authority's last um, five-year plan that they put out, um, they slated um, a loss of about 461 seats in District 30 that was slated uh, f to be funded, mm -hmm. and in District 24, a loss of 3,961 seats. Um, building, taking away two schools originally, which were supposed to be at one of the sites, and I believe that the proposal now is for one school. How is that going to meet the needs, the existing needs, that are in that district to begin with? Yeah. Uh, Mr. Chair, thank you for the question, and you've been a leader on these issues, and we appreciate your leadership on education issues going back many years. You're absolutely right. It's a really important issue in Long Island City. Council Member Van Bramer has emphasized its importance, frankly, extending beyond this project in general is an important issue to his constituents, um, and we hear about it from them all the time. Frankly, that is why I think there was one of the main reasons why there was so much concern about the previously planned projects, which was that the units of housing would put a greater impact on the schools. You know, we believe in Lyon City, this impact um, will, will be lower on school need within that sub-district um, than the originally planned projects were expected. That'll all be borne out in the environmental impact analysis. But that being said, it's critically important. We still have, a, so there was a plan for two schools we're still planning uh, to do school, two schools if we identify that those are required. The intermediate school on campus, and there's a second site that's located um, to the south of there that we also are working with the School Construction Authority on that's still a part of this agreement. Uh, fundamentally, I mean, this should be net better for schools in Long Island City, but we have to look at it and we have to continue to make investments, and that's part of the reason for the, we, you know, we had discussed this, we're including the CEC chair as a part of our infrastructure, um, infrastructure subcommittee, so we'll be getting their input as well as to what the needs are. So you're committing to two schools? We have, we have a definitely a committed school. We have a second option to build a school. It's just, 
as to whether that location makes the most sense. It's a discussion. One of the things with all these development projects that absolutely drives me crazy yeah. is that they put one school, oftentimes in elementary, and no consideration as to where kids are going to go to middle school yeah. and then or to high school. Well, this is so an There should be a commitment for three schools, okay. not one or two, three schools. Okay. I appreciate that. I know you appreciate it. What are you going to do about it? <laughs> There's, the plan is definitely for an intermediate school on site. Um, we're also working with the council member uh, and the SCA to identify a school, a new school site in the core of Lyon City. Um, and on top of that, we have an additional site that could be a location for a third school. It's not a question of whether or not we'll make the investments. It's a question of whether that location makes the most sense for the community in terms of where the needs are. In that site where the um, DOE building is, there was a program in there called Power My Learning. Yes. Uh, what's going to happen with that program? That program provides computers yep. to uh, low-income uh, folks mm -hmm. who would otherwise not have it, and then it's um, stuffed with educational materials. Yeah. They desperately need that space, and if they're evicted from that space, they will not be able to provide those programs. We will ensure that they get a space that meets their needs. I know you mentioned this earlier. I assure you we'll working, our, our have already started conversations. So with that's them. a guarantee? Yes. We'll get that in writing? I'm happy to provide it in any okay. form that's acceptable. All right. Um, let, me, let me go to a little bit of uh, uh, an issue um, of tax avoidance. I think they're going to pull up a, uh, a chart on this also. The council's research into Amazon's tax history yielded some great insight into the company's aggressive tax avoidance measures. The Institute of Taxation and Economic Policy reports that through various loopholes, Amazon essentially paid zero federal taxes on reported U.S. profits of $5.6 billion in 2017. In Europe, Amazon was investigated by the EU Commission for illegally obtained tax advantages in Luxembourg and ordered to pay 250 million pounds, uh, excuse me, 250 million euros in back taxes to the country. The chart on the screen shows the lengths to which Amazon went to avoid taxes in that case. Is this uh, is it accurate that Amazon really did not pay any federal taxes in 2017? And if so, how was able, Amazon able to do that? Yeah, Chairman, I uh, want to disagree and say that we do pay uh, our taxes. In 2017 in particular, that was a year of heavy reinvestment um, back into our businesses. We uh, spent billions and billions of dollars uh, on fulfillment centers. And in that particular year, that reinvestment reduced the federal taxable income. Uh, in other years, we paid billions uh, of dollars in taxes. As referring to the, the Luxembourg situation in particular, we located our, our EU headquarters in Luxembourg back in 2003, and it made sense from a business strategy to help serve our entire European operations there. It's a very a central uh, point uh, for the European continent. And we have over 1,500 current employees uh, there, so it is a, a substantial presence in headquarters. And in regard to that particular ruling that, uh, that you've identified, that was a case brought not against Amazon, but it brought against Luxembourg, and it's currently being appealed. Well, it's exactly these types of schemes, I'll call them schemes, even the, re, the, the, re, the, the reinvestment that you are talking about that concerns us because uh, it seems that large companies, corporations, always come up with these uh, ways that they can avoid paying tax and, and they call it a reinvestment in the community or whatever. Um, so it still is of major concern to us here that Amazon continues to do that, that operate in that type of way. Well, Chairman, you know, we've created uh, over 250,000 jobs in the U.S. We pay taxes you know, at the federal, state, How much? Uh, kind of local level, uh, billions How of dollars. How much in taxes does Amazon pay? Billions of dollars. Um, billions? Yes. You don't have the exact number? I don't have the exact number in front of me. Okay. It would be good to get that. Yes, sir. Um, let me talk a little bit about Amazon as an employer. Uh, the rationale for providing incentives for Amazon to come to New York is to improve the lives of New Yorkers. The most obvious impact will be the uh, availability of up to 40,000 jo 40, jobs the company will bring to Long Island City. Uh, of the top, uh, uh, of the up to 40,000 jobs that you plan uh, to hire as part of HQ2 in Long Island City, what share would you say would be considered management? So our split at our headquarters um, in our corporate jobs is about 50% tech, 50% non-tech. Um, and our managers in the corporate environment typically manage six to 10 people uh, each, so I'm not that good at doing the math off the top of my head. 
um, but the smaller percentage would be management. So can you provide us with a list of those titles and the numbers of people that will fill them? So when we, we absolutely can tell you in general what those are. We have not identified the businesses that will be in the new headquarters yet, but they by and large should be consistent with our other locations like the, one we, like the sites we have here in Manhattan now. Okay, so talking about your other locations, currently, according to Amazon's own reports, women make up only 26% of its management, but in New York City, that number is 55%. Similarly, people of color were underrepresented at Amazon, with minorities only making up 37% of the management structure, compared to about half in New York City. Uh, to, to EDC, let me ask this question. Um, how do these figures lead you to believe that this is a company that will benefit all New Yorkers if its structure is so heavily white and male. You know, the, the council member, uh, I certainly appreciate the question. Uh, you know, the, fundamentally, New York City is it's, it's a city that is incredibly diverse. Queens is the most diverse county in the country. The fact that the company is planning to come here is an opportunity for us to show the world what tech should look like, and particularly what tech looks like in New York. Frankly, I think the fact that the company work in a place like Seattle, um, having 36%, uh, 37% of their workers um, being non-white is a reasonably good start relative to their competitors, but it's not enough, and we certainly have higher expectations when they come to the city. And, and Sherman, uh, if I may. Um, exactly agree with your concern and from the very beginning of this process and our request for proposals uh, we uh, we ask cities and locations to identify the diverse nature of their talent pool we are very excited about coming to New York taking advantage of the diverse talent pool here yesterday I had the opportunity um, to go to our existing uh, one of our existing facilities in Manhattan and talk with some of our employee groups there and we have a number of affinity groups at Amazon Amazon women engineers our black employees network our LGBT uh, employee group, they're very excited uh, by being able um, uh, to bring on more mm -hmm. colleagues uh, that are diverse. It's a very important part of our DNA. You have to have a diverse employee population in order to reach the right results for your customers, and that's one of the uh, things we're most Do excited about. Do you know about. the percentages of the makeup in the Manhattan office? In the Manhattan office, I, I do not uh, know Can that. Can you get that to us? Yes, sir. Okay, and then uh, will you commit to public annual reports of the workforce demographics in Long Island City. Yes, sir, we make, uh, we make workforce uh, reports uh, public uh, already, and uh, yes, let me talk with our HR team about that. Okay, in some regards, Amazon does have um, a fairly decent um, reputation for some good pay and some strong benefits. For example, all full-time employees at Amazon do get up to five months of paid maternity leave. But this is also the company that was the center of um, a 2015 New York Times article that gave numerous examples of the stressful work conditions and high burnout rates of employees at the Seattle headquarters. A recent New York Post article highlighted workers at the Staten Island warehouse peeing in bottles because the only bathroom was far away and workers were told they were taking too much um, idle time. So is Amazon a pleasant place to work? It definitely is, and I would encourage you to. I would encourage you to talk with some of the employees we have here. I would love for you to come to visit our Manhattan offices, to visit our Staten Island Fulfillment Center, and see. So, for why yourself. are the Staten Island employees wanting, uh, fighting to form a union? I, I, well, sir, I, I don't believe that that's accurate. Our employees um, make $17 to $23 an hour at the Staten Island facility. They have world-class benefits, including medical and health care benefits on day one, access to our career choice educational programs. These are good jobs. And again, I would encourage you to uh, come and talk to those employees yourself. All right. Let, let, me, let, me, um, let, me, let me ask a question about how is Amazon going to ensure that the uh, food service workers um, are good jobs and uh, not uh, poverty jobs, poverty level jobs. 
So as we um, stated previously, uh, so we're not kind of your typical um, headquarters. We don't have a lot of food service within um, our corporate campus, and we don't really even build campus. We build neighborhoods. And we, and I can only reference what we do in Seattle, is that in Seattle, we have constructed our food service to only feed a third of our employees. Um, so we get coffee and tea and water, um, and there's banana stands. Uh, but we typically, we push our employees out so we can actually patron the local businesses. So most of our office buildings have first floor retail so they can grab a sandwich or a coffee or grab an early dinner. Well, I heard that in your testimony, but I'm concerned about some of the contractors as well. Uh, the subcontractors, other large companies like Microsoft and Facebook mandate minimum leave and pay standards for workers who are employed by subcontractors. So um, on, our, on our food service specifically, and again, we're still in early stages here, so we haven't identified who we're going to partner with um, in our New York City headquarters. Um, but in Seattle, first of all, all of, our, um, all of our employees and our vendors make $15 minimum wage. But in Seattle, we've also done a unique program called Fair Start. And Fair Start is a nonprofit organization that actually takes previously incarcerated individuals and puts them into training in the food service industry. So we have recently opened a, a large restaurant, over 25,000 square feet of food service that actually is open to the public on our headquarters that Fair Start runs. And it gives those, gives those individuals a chance to learn back of the house and front of the house skills in the restaurant industry. We also use Fair Start internally with our employees. Do you know how many of um, Amazon's current workforce receive public assistance or SNAP benefits? I do not. Because with $15 an hour, and I'm glad that we've done it, it's, we still need to work to make that actually a higher minimum wage. Uh, it's, it's still extremely difficult, especially in New York City, to get by on $15 an hour. So I, I will say, and I, I don't disagree with you, um, but the, our fulfillment center workers in Staten Island actually it's 17 to $23 an hour. And as you also know that, you know, we were one of the first companies to do a $15 minimum wage for all of our U.S. employees, um, including our third party and seasonal workers. In addition to that, we're pushing for federal um, legislation. Are any of your workers unionized? No, sir. Well, uh, to be honest with you, I, I agree fully with the, with the speaker's uh, s statements about this being a union town, and, uh, and, and we, we definitely support uh, the, uh, the unionized workforce here in New York City and um, really urge you to reconsider your, your position and your answer on that. Um, before I turn it over to my colleagues, I have a question from um, Ava Fort Fidal on Twitter. Is Amazon willing to share statistics on how many people in their Seattle offices uh, were local for five years or plus before being um, uh, hired? hired by them, and what is the average age, salary, and education level of the workforce? So I can't speak to that now. We could certainly talk about, um, get, come back to you with the percentage of our workforce in Seattle that were local hire versus um, those that were relocated. It's difficult to go back and before someone was hired to understand where they live, but we can look at relocation data and provide that to you. Uh, but also, I think to kind of to the larger question, which is getting at whether we will hire um, New Yorkers you know, for these jobs. Uh, Washington State is, has a small population. The entire state you know, is three million. Um, the talent pool of New York, the availability of talent currently here in New York, is uh, I, I, why we came here. We're very excited to hire from the New York uh, talent pool. So if that's if that is what the uh, kind of the intent of the question uh, is behind, um, I can tell you we absolutely will hire New Yorkers. We also want to develop the talent pipeline to hire New Yorkers not only today but in the future. Our programs such as Amazon Future Engineer, our program to hire NYCHA residents for our customer service departments is exactly the types of things you're going to see us do. Okay, thank you. Uh, I'm going to turn it over now to Council Member Jimmy Van Bramer in whose district Amazon uh, may reside. <laughs> thank you very much. So I, I want to start off um, uh, with Amazon's really remarkable statement here today that you will not remain neutral and that you will continue to be an anti-union corporation. I want to say to you, not a recommendation, but shame on you. Shame on you, shame on your corporation for coming to New York City. Because both you and I believe uh, the administration have made a distinction somehow 
that because this is a headquarters, those people working in those buildings don't need representation, don't deserve to be in a union. All workers should have the right to be in a union. All workers should have the right. You are too big. You are too big and too strong and too powerful. And the thing that's always been the equalizer for workers and working people are unions and the ability to come together and form real power against people like Jeff Bezos. You have come here today unabashedly, unashamedly, and said no to the speaker's question. We're not neutral. We do not want our Amazon workers to be union. And it is wrong to hide behind the deal with 32BJ and the building trades and say somehow this is a pro-union deal. It's not. It's a union-busting deal from the beginning. <clears throat> Folks, if we could use this, it would be much very helpful. So I want to say to both of you, there is an opt-out clause here, right? What is the opt-out clause? Isn't it that both of you, both sides, all sides, uh, have 60 days uh, in writing to notify the other partner that the deal is off? Is that true? What is the nature of the opt-out clause in this deal? Well, I, the, 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 the first, of, first of all, the council member, I, I just, I, I just want to emphasize, we're not making false distinctions here. We're focusing on the project that's before us, which we think is going to create up to 40,000 jobs. That's why we think this is an important deal. That being said, you're right. The MOU itself is non-binding. It means we, it's, there's a, a component of it that asks us to notify the other party uh, and give them 60 days notice if we're not proceeding. But in, there's nothing binding about the MOU in the first place. It's an initial document. So that's good to know. Uh, which would mean that it's actually somewhat uh, simple at this point to say to Amazon that as long as you continue to work with ICE and harass immigrants in this country, so long as you come here and say no to remaining neutral, that the city of New York has the ability to revoke this deal now. Is that true? The, the, this is a good deal for the city. It's more than it's it's uh, it's more than thirteen and a half billion dollars in tax revenue. Uh, I know you had concerns about the previous plans for these sites as well. I think we're excited about the opportunity this brings to diversify our tech workforce, to bring more jobs to the residents of Queens and throughout the city. It's an incredible opportunity. So we're not walking away from this, the biggest economic development jobs creator of our lifetimes. I understand your position on that. The question though is does the mayor of the city of New York today have the ability to say to Amazon that so long as you work with ICE and so long as you remain anti-union, we will revoke and renege on this agreement at this point? That's the question. I understand how you feel about the deal and that you think mm -hmm. it's the greatest thing that's ever happened. <laughs> but, but I'm asking a very simple question, which is can the mayor right now, today, say to Amazon, that as long as you work with ICE, that you can't have a sanctuary city where we support the work of ICE. And you can't have a union town that has one of the largest corporations in the world come here today and say flat out, with no apologies whatsoever, no, we're not going to remain neutral. We don't want Amazon employees, direct Amazon employees, to be unionized. The mayor has the ability right now to pull the deal based on those two answers? Yes or no? Could he do it? The, the, the mayor can, uh, has the authority to make whatever decisions he wants at any given time. Um, so that's he the, is a yes. big supporter of this transaction and also a big supporter of immigrant rights. You know, from the very outset of the Trump administration, the mayor has been pushing back in every single way to demonstrate that we are committed to keeping immigrants in our city and continuing our history as a, sanctu as a sanctuary city where immigrants can feel safe. I'm not disputing any of that, James, okay. and I'm not attacking that. All I'm saying is that if Amazon is working with ICE and supplying them with facial recognition technology mm -hmm. and other things that then make ICE's efforts 
much more successful in tracking down and harassing immigrants in this country, documented or undocumented, that is wrong. Yeah. That is wrong. Even if it's legal, it's immoral. Yeah. Because I heard Mr. Houseman say before that if they come to the conclusion that someone they're working with or someone that the company is selling technology to is violating people's rights, that they would then cancel the contract. But there are things that are legal in this country today mm -hmm. that are immoral when it comes to immigrants. Yeah, would, that is not a good enough answer. So I want to say that I believe, James, that the mayor could today revoke this deal because, and I heard him say that when this all was arranged, maybe he wasn't fully uh, as aware of ICE's uh, uh, work and the allegations made with Amazon. And he's also, he's also said he's very concerned about it and he needs a conversation with the company to discuss it further. And we, we are absolutely concerned about it. We share your concerns. Absolutely. Yeah. So then will you say today that if the mayor comes to understand that Amazon does work with ICE and is working with ICE, that you will then revoke the deal knowing now what you know? Uh, I, I, I don't no, we have any facts about what's actually happening. Because they and, won't say. <laughs> I think the mayor is going to be discussing that with the company directly. I don't want to engage in hypotheticals. Ultimately, it's his decision how to proceed. And so right now, he believes in the job opportunity. I, 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 I am uh, being very respectful. I just want right. to say, if the mayor is going to have a conversation with Jeff Bezos mm -hmm. about whether or not Amazon is working with ICE, shouldn't that conversation happen now and not? as this deal goes further and further down the train, what are we, what are we waiting for? Absolutely. Um, let me just say this again also about the labor deal. You talk about 32BJ and uh, uh, you talk about uh, the trades. The truth is that in the prior incarnation of the then Euler land use actions that were being discussed, those folks had already entered into uh, agreements to work uh, at, with those projects, correct? Um, uh, that there were signed letters in some cases and certainly agreements that they were going to work on those properties. Certainly, I mean, you, you may know better than I do for the, for the Plaxall sites, but for the, I mean, I'm not aware of those agreements. They may have existed. There certainly was an agreement for the city-owned sites. Yeah, there were, which means that you have inherited and honored those deals that were already in place. We, we have insisted those deals be honored. And Amazon has agreed, but those are yes. not new labor union agreements per se. They are really carryovers from what was going to be uh, uh, an agreement in the previous year. Let me just ask this. Amazon got a lot out of this deal. So my question to you, Mr. Patchett, did Amazon get everything they asked for in this deal? Absolutely not. Did you say no? to anything that they asked for, or was anything too much? Absolutely. Was there any point that this administration said, you know what, we can't do that, that is too much? We gave, we gave them nothing. We did not give them, promise them any incentives. What we worked with them on was to identify real estate opportunities, and then we insisted that they pay fair market value for them. Certainly, they asked about discretionary incentives. Certainly, we talked about valuations, but it was our position from the beginning that this all needed to be done on a fair market value basis. We didn't, we didn't have the ability to change state law preemptively, but uh, we didn't offer them a single dollar of discretionary incentives. So you, you answered the first question, did Amazon get everything they asked for by saying no. Can you tell us what you said no to? I mean, there, as, as you know, there are a series of discretionary incentives uh, that the city has traditionally used in transactions like this, like for instance in the JetBlue agreement in Long Island City, uh, which had a series of discretionary incentives that were a part of that agreement. Um, and I mean, the company asked for information on all of them and we m made it clear from the outset that they weren't gonna be on the table. There's mortgage recording tax, sales tax, extended property tax benefits, uh, all of the discretionary powers that the city has that we didn't put on the table. Uh, New York City um, and the state in partnership, I suppose, have uh, uh, decided to locate an opportunity zone here uh, at the same time as you were negotiating the deal with the Amazon. 
is it just a coincidence that, that Long Island City, which is clearly not in need of additional development incentives, was chosen as an opportunity zone? And how much will Jeff Bezos benefit from this designation? Um, you want to take I'll take that. I can't talk to the designation of the Opportunity Zone. I can defer that to Mr. Patchett and his team. Um, but we will not be um, using the Opportunity Zone on this project. Uh, sure, the, it's, it's, there's it, the, the process, um, this, the, the, so the, there's the, the Opportunity Zones are a federal program, part of a tax overhaul that the mayor and this administration, and I'm sure the council objected to, um, comprehensive uh, tax reform that we had significant issues with at the federal level. Uh, we, the, the state uh, were the ones who were responsible for recommending, recommending opportunity zones. And uh, you know, my understanding is that they made those recommendations to the Treasury Department in April of last year. So at, at that point in time, uh, the company had not even come to visit any sites in the city yet. Uh, excuse me. Uh, just a couple more questions. Uh, um, Amazon, you, you talked about your uh, uh, jobs um, for public housing residents today. Uh, we've read in the press, you didn't include it in your testimony, that that would be 30 jobs, as in three zero um, jobs. Um, is that correct? That is correct. Those 30 are the first jobs that we're announcing for HQ2, that's 30 of the 700 for 2019. That's the same size as the customer service facility that we have in our Seattle headquarters. And the reason that those, for me, that I'm excited about those jobs is those provide an entree to a career. Tom Weiland, who runs our global customer service organization, began as a part-time customer service agent. And those jobs create a pathway that with some training and work experience make other jobs available within the company. So they're a great entry point and a ladder to development for members of the community. So I, I just want to say, um, before I go in this round, there is so much that you are getting and there is so little that you are giving. The fact that you are, are coming here today after all of this, two months uh, of, of just getting crushed, I believe, uh, rightfully so on this deal, uh, you come with, with 30 jobs um, for the people in public housing. Meanwhile, there are several thousand uh, people living uh, within uh, the Queensbridge houses alone. And you are just not uh, listening. You are just not hearing us. You are spending more to mail those garbage mailers all over the city of New York than you are on the people of Queensbridge right now. That is outrageous. It is absolutely outrageous what you are doing. You are saying that you are coming to listen, and then you are going to act. But what you're really doing is hiring high-powered public relations firms who are telling you that if you just mail enough of this crap out, that somehow it's going to get better. But it's not going to get better, not because of the mailers or not because of the mailers. It's because of what you're doing here and how little you're offering, how much you're taking, and how wrong this deal is. With that, so I'll with come all back due respect, second. while those are the first 30 that we're announcing, they're not the only 30. And that idea, sir, came from conversations with the Community Advisory Committee. It may only be 30 to start. But that's how I started the veterans pilot. It was 16, and it's over 1,000 now. And I'm proud of that. Those are jobs that create a ladder and a pathway for people who may not otherwise have access to jobs that come up the corporate ladder. Uh, uh, thank you to the one clapper um, for that. <clears throat> uh, hold up, hold up. We're not, we're not going to have clapping. Amazon executives for clapping for Amazon executives. Um, <laughs> Let me just say this. Are you equally proud to be a part of an effort to crush unions? 
Councilor Moore, we are not, that is not an accurate representation. We have great paying jobs. We respect an employee's right to choose or to not join a union. We are very proud of that direct connection we have. But the goal that you are trying to achieve is good jobs, not low paying jobs. We pay 17 to $23 an hour in Stan in Stan Island. Your goal is to have not dead end jobs, but jobs with advance, mm -hmm. room for advance, well, growth opportunities. Mr. Houseman, we provide those respect, with our career choice education programs. And your goal is also to provide jobs that provide great benefits. And we do that with our day one health care and our generous parental leave. With, I'm with very proud respect, of the jobs Mr. Houseman, that we're Councilman. With all due respect, you just categorized what I want. You said you. You want. And then you rattled off a series of jobs. Let me tell you a little bit about what I want when it comes to jobs. I want good paying union jobs. I want good paying union jobs at all levels, and that's what I want. Don't make it seem like it's an uh, either and or situation. Like you have a decided corporate ethos. You have a decidedly very clear corporate culture. You are very proud to come here today and say that no Amazon employees are members of a labor union. I believe that is fundamentally wrong. Fundamentally wrong. Given how big you are, given how much you're growing all the time, you are part of the problem because you are increasing the pool of workers who are not unionized. Because you come here to this city, our city, and you talk to me. Right? I grew up in Astoria, Queens. My stepfather was a janitor, a janitor who cleaned the toilets in junior high school 10. My mother worked at Key Food and was a meat wrapper. My father was a pressman. None of them graduated from high school. They all got lucky and got to be a part of a union, a union, right? Which allowed me to have dental and vision, which allowed me to then dream that I might be able to go to school. So don't talk to me about what I want. I know what I want, and I know what you should be open to, which is good paying union jobs at Amazon. And you're not, you're just simply not, you said it yourself. That's outrageous. So it's a fair question. You should be proud of any jobs that you create, but you should not be proud to be a part of an entity that is so decidedly anti-union. That is wrong, and that is my right to say to you, thank you. Okay. I'm going to uh, move on here a little bit now. Uh, Reap and ICAP, and then I'm going to go to just a quick question now, and I'll go to my colleagues as well. They've been waiting a while. Reap and ICAP both uh, require renewal by um, uh, by the state legislator in 2020 and 2022. So has this administration provided any type of guarantee or assurance, either verbal, written, or otherwise, about the stance you might take in lobbying efforts, um, either publicly or privately, on the renewal of REAP and ICAP? No. We uh, have not provided any insurances to anyone about those matters. What, we have, what we've done is said we're not going to offer any discretionary incentives, and we've stuck to that. But yet the MOU says that the city and state will commit to secure passage of any necessary legislation to facilitate financing and implementation of the project. Yeah, that's a reference to the, um, the, what, the, what the state needs to do in terms of the general project So this plan. does not include REAP or ICAP? It's not our commitment. Okay. All right. Um, Council Member Adams followed by... Um, Oh, yeah, I'm going to have to put people on a clock also, so three-minute clock. Council Member Adams, followed by Grudenchik, and then Cornegie. Thank you, Chair Drum. Thank you uh, to the panel for being here again today to present yourselves before this council. I have to echo the sentiments of my colleague, uh, Council Member Van Bramer. Um, I, too, come from a union household, very proud union household. Uh, my mother retired from corrections uh, from... Um, for this city of New York for a number of years. My father retired after 35 years working as a teamster for UPS. So I too am absolutely uh, incensed uh, by your insensitivity when it comes to this town, this very proud, strong union town. So my first question to you, 
and they're coming from some of my constituents, and I'm really happy about this. Amazon has a long history of union busting and unsafe workplaces. There was a death at the Joliet Warehouse in 2017 after Amazon delayed calling the ambulance for one of their employees after the person had a heart attack. Why should our city, one that prides itself on being union friendly and worker conscious, accept you if this is not your creed? Council member, uh, any incident and uh, the fatality is it's very tragic. I will tell you that we have safe uh, working uh, conditions. Um, we, I would love for you to come to our Staten Island facility to see for yourself um, these working conditions. As to that specific incident, we worked closely with OSHA and OSHA did determine that our safety procedures uh, were followed and were not a contributing cause. But um, of course, that is a very tragic incident. It's still a very disturbing uh, part of your history, but I'm going to move on to something else. Amazon claims its presence in New York will be good for small businesses. How can Amazon make that claim when it regularly uses small businesses' sales data from its website to stock inventory and undercut prices, putting small realtors out of business? How can you make that claim when you actively encourage your employees to shop through Amazon? Council member, uh, Amazon, um, actually half of what you buy uh, on Amazon is not sold by us, but it's sold you know, by third parties. Uh, we allow small businesses to reach customers around the world in uh, a way online that they would not have been able to do uh, otherwise. We're very proud of our small business customers. In New York State, we have over 81,000 sellers that sell on Amazon, and we have nationwide over 140,000 small businesses that make over $100,000 uh, a year in sales. Uh, small businesses are an essential part of what we're able uh, to offer customers. So when a brick and mortar retail store goes out of business partly due to the inability to compete with e-commerce giants like yourselves, the vacant storefront it leaves behind causes harm and it blights the streets, takes away from an element of the community and hurts the local economy and lowers tax revenue. Do you believe you owe anything to the city for the public harm that the loss of small businesses and empty storefronts create? Amazon, again, empowers small businesses to reach customers that they would not have been able to otherwise. We are 1% of global uh, retail. And uh, as Holly and others mentioned, in the Long Island City neighborhood in particular, we're excited for our employees to go out in the community and patronize the small businesses there. And Mr. Chair, if you'll just allow me just, just, just two minutes, I, I just have to get this out. The subsidy issue, given the public outrage created by Amazon, one of the richest companies in the U.S., assess accessing billions of dollars in tax breaks, and that over a billion of that will come from New York City's as-of-right programs, would you consider our subsidy system broken? Uh, council member, the, the, the appreciate the questions. It, just to go back for a moment, I want to point out there's no question that the concerns about small businesses are very real, but that's not just about Amazon. The economy is changing globally, and small businesses are adapting, and we're excited to have Amazon here in the city uh, to help uh, the small businesses on the ground in Long Island City get on the platform and also uh, receive customers. On top of that, you know, to your point, I mean, I think fundamentally you and I would probably agree that there should be economic tools at our disposal to encourage more job growth at good paying jobs in places that are not just the core of Manhattan. Too many of the jobs that are created in our city are just in Manhattan, and that's what the economic development tools that are available under state law or that are required under state law are, I think, intended to do, but I agree with you that we need to look at them together and make a determination about how effective they are and whether they can do more to further uh, encourage true geographic diversity in terms of high-quality jobs across the city. And one final thing, in looking at this $3 billion subsidy, a great statement was given to me, so I won't take credit for this, but instead of funding Amazon giveaways, the New York state and city governments could fund a range of timely and important projects. $3 billion in investments in infrastructure and public schools, including housing, transportation, clean energy, and clean water projects would create over 75,000 good paying jobs, most of them or many of them unionized. $3 billion could help create 
or preserve over 66,000 units of affordable housing in New York City. For $800 million, the City University of New York could also become completely tuition free. $3 billion could repair the boilers, piping, and radiators across the full New York City Housing Authority system. The 400,000 people who make these apartments their home could have more reliable heat if the city funded repairs. $3 billion could be put towards emergency funding to fix the subway service. While it's not the estimated $19 billion infrastructure investment required to fund the subway, it certainly would be a start. And finally, New York State could use that $3 billion to start paying back the $4.2 billion it owes school districts following a 2006 court ruling that found the state was in violation of the Constitution by chronically underfunding schools in low-income communities and communities of color. I represent Southeastern Queens, and these are my concerns. That's something to consider. Thank you. And, and council, council Member, I completely agree with your constituents' assessment, and I think we are talking about $3 billion. This deal is going to bring over $27 billion to the state. So think about how much more we can do, nine times as much a good as you referenced in your test, in your uh, point, nine times as many investments in our city and our state. And I also agree with you about the state. <laughs> okay, thank you. And uh, let me just say I forgot to announce that we were joined by council member and the chair of the finance committee, on, uh, subcommittee on capital, Vanessa Gibson, uh, council member uh, Levin, and council member uh, Diaz was here as well. And we were also joined, I understand, by assembly member Catalina Cruz, who's in the audience. Um, and with that, um, I'd like to now uh, turn it over to uh, Council Member Barry Grudenchik. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I was going to say good morning, but it's now good afternoon. Uh, I want to thank you all for being here today. Um, I do want to uh, hit on the union issue. Um, just to give you an idea what it's about for me, um, my wife is a member of the New York State United Teachers. Um, my Chief of Staff's mother was a member of the UFT and CSA. My council's parents were both members of DC 37. My mother retired from DC 37. Uh, I grew up in New York City public housing across the street from the Great Electchester Complex, which was built by the International Brotherhood of Electrical Workers Local 3. Uh, between those two developments, 4,500 people uh, lived in affordable and very, very decent housing. And I myself are a member, a former member of Local 338 RWDSU. Our chair is a former UFT member. That's, thank you. Um, so there's a pattern here. Um, in my building growing up in public housing, five of the six primary bread earners were members of unions, teachers, um, not teachers, I'm sorry, uh, cops and letter carriers and all those kind of things. It's very tough for me to support this, given the fact that all we're really asking you to do, from the speaker on down, the chairman, Councilman Van Bramer, and uh, Councilwoman Adams, is just to stay neutral. Uh, you could be like Switzerland here. You got all the money, and you, you know, you would, you'd be neutral. Um, it, 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 it pains me that I can't get that out of you. No one else has been able to get that out of you. Um, there's no guarantee that your workers would agree to join a union, and I, I just want to leave you with that. You've already given your answer, but I hope you'll take that back to the powers that be. Mr. Patchett, the average job um, has been claimed at $150,000 a year. Not bad. Um, can you tell me what the mode is? I'm married to a math professor, so be careful. Uh, the mode. <laughs> oh, um, we, we don't have that, 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 the data yet about the mode, no. Because that's critical information, because if somebody is making $20 million a year mm -hmm. and somebody is making $17 an hour, mm -hmm. that is a huge discrepancy. And so when those numbers are thrown around, um, it concerns me. So I would hope that by the time we come for the next hearing, which I think will be a land use hearing, you'll be able to answer that question. The other thing that concerns me is that those people, my district borders on Nassau County, those people that live in Nassau County don't pay New York City income tax. I can't expect that from them, but I do expect the people that live in New York City to pay that tax, as we all do. Mm -hmm. And so I'm wondering, your revenues, um, $13.5 billion, I don't know how many years that's over? 25. 25, that's a lot of money. It's, it's um, what have, do you have, can you tell me, um, 
whether or not um, you estimated that at 100 percent of the people who work for Amazon living in New York City, or that some of them are certainly not going to live in New York City. They're going to live in New Jersey. They're going to live in Westchester. Yeah. They're going to live mm -hmm. uh, in Nassau and Suffolk counties. Yeah. So we, the 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 economic impact model that we that we use does evaluate the location of individual workers. Um, we we don't. I don't have the specific date in front of me, happy to share it afterwards, but it's, it certainly accounts for an assumption that some percentage of the workers uh, would live outside the city, although we expect the vast majority to live in New York City, significant number in Queens. Um, and you know, I, I want to go back to your point about the, the wages. I think it's an important point. Actually, it's a, I, it's a critical it's point. It's a critical point. Because if, oh. if somebody making $10 million a mm -hmm. year yes. lives on the other side of the Queens border or lives mm -hmm. in Westchester or New Jersey, yeah. That tax revenue is not coming to the city of New York. It's well, I mean, going somewhere else. Absolutely. I think a couple of a couple of things about that. I would say that I actually am excited about the fact that there will be a diversity of, of job ranges at the headquarters because I also think that it, it means more accessible jobs um, in some parts of the company, more places where more NYCHA residents can have entrees into the company. The city is certainly committed to working with the company and the community to make the necessary workforce investments to ensure that we have a diverse population of people working at the company. And the good thing, as, as you know, is that regardless of where the workers live, the company will be subject to the 8.85 percent municipal tax rate as well as the state's 6.5 percent rate. I appreciate that, assuming they do finish the deal, because we have a history in this town and the state of deals that have not been consummated. Uh, I would appreciate getting that information on the mode as uh, quickly as possible from EDC. Okay. Um, mean, median, mode, whatever you. I know mode is the most important okay. because um, that will tell us what the most most people will be making at the average salary. So to me, and I understand you may not be able to pin it down exactly, but. I would like to know what number of people are going to be making under, say, 50,000, between 50 and 100, um, over one, 100 to 150, and then how many people you expect will be making a million dollars a year or more. So that's critical because um, I'm not accusing anybody of being a liar, but you know, I was taught a long time ago by a friend who was an accountant. He said, "Figures lie, and liars figure." So yeah. we need to we need to know those exact numbers because that's critically important. Um, to my way of thinking. Well, I thank you for taking my questions. Thank you for indulging me, Mr. Chairman. And I look forward to seeing you all at the next hearing. Thank you. Council Member uh, Cornegie. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, I'm going to keep my questions and my comments specifically to the um, aforementioned talent pipeline and education pipeline. Um, I don't think I've ever. so. While I respect and appreciate the commitment to higher education and even to the high schools, um, as somebody who's a, a father of six children, I understand that it doesn't begin there. It's, you know, the, this, this sustainable pipeline for education and pipeline to these high wage jobs really begins in elementary and junior high school and creating a, cur a curriculum that will be supportive of putting New Yorkers and our students into that pipeline. Um, so I haven't, I haven't heard a, a, a real solid message for doing that, who you've worked with with the DOE to get that done, and what the actual figure uh, of expense or resources from Amazon, what's the actual number, numerical commitment um, to, to this education pipeline? Uh, council member thank you let me let me start with absolutely agree with you that we have a unique opportunity because of the horizon of the deal to not only look at the short term um, kind of what I'd call quicker wins and then look at high school junior high but it really begins in that that K to 8 and providing exposure to not only to technology but also to career connected experiences so that that children whose parents may work in different kinds of jobs can see what the possibilities are the Amazon future engineers program is is just one of those programs we've been working with the Department of Education um, as well as with the Community Advisory Committee, which contains educators, uh, labor, not-for-profit, for-profit, um, to understand the kinds of programs that are working now. Um, I know from my experience with the Career Choice Program that one size doesn't fit all, uh, and the work with, the, with Governor Inslee's uh, education initiative in Washington that 
bringing parties to the table together so that we can look at that entire stream from kindergarten all the way through post-secondary uh, is critical. Uh, one of the things we suffer from at the city sometimes is um, agencies not talking to each other. I'm wondering if you're having a real open dialogue uh, with Chancellor Carranza on a curriculum that's jointly established to make sure that we're a part of this pipeline. I haven't heard that, and it concerns me. Um, I, on the list, I have a high school on the list, right, which I'm excited about. There's at least two more I'd like to suggest, but there's one on the list, um, uh, P-TECH being another one, where, where students are already ready and, and being prepared to assume those roles and jobs. That's not on the list, but I'm going to obviously flag for you that that should be on the list. And then also there are, there is the National Society of Black Engineers who works with, um, with uh, career readiness and in my district and in districts like mine to prepare young minority students to go into colleges that are geared around engineering. We have an opportunity to do both. I want to flag for you that. And then I, lastly, I want to say, um, uh, I'm, I'm concerned with the narrative that the uh, NYCHA development workers will be geared towards the low wage jobs. I know offhand at least 10 people who live in NYCHA that have graduate degrees, uh, but finding this city is difficult to find a place to live. And that's the last bastion of affordable housing, unfortunately, in mass mm -hmm. in the city. So um, I don't want to make, I want to make sure that my NYCHA residents are be, aren't being relegated specifically yeah to low wage jobs because there are people there who are prepared also to be a part of this talent pipeline that you suggested. Yeah, I absolutely agree with you, council member, and thank you, thank you for your comments. I think uh, the, the, there needs to be a breadth of jobs because there are a breadth of different skill sets in NYCHA and frankly across the city as, as you pointed out. Um, I mean, we, I think we all know the, hist the long history of, of NYCHA as being a, a middle class and working class place for people across the city to live, and it needs to continue to be that. Um, that's why we're investing in, uh, and the city is investing in job readiness uh, at, at uh, the local for NYCHA uh, developments, but also in IT training, uh, which is for higher level cybersecurity jobs, um, in, it, jobs in coding and information technology. Uh, from our perspective, NYCHA residents should get all of these jobs, should get, be eligible for all of these jobs. And, and just lastly for Amazon, I didn't hear the number. And, and for me, um, it's, it's less, it, it becomes more rhetoric if there's not a solid uh, uh, financial commitment to this curriculum uh, uh, formulation from the entity. And I, and I, haven't, I haven't heard that. Yes, so we're, um, you know, just launched the Amazon Future Engineer Program. It's going to be at least millions uh, of dollars. Uh, but I can follow up with you as we figure out the... So I'm, I'm looking forward to, um, with, <laughs> with uh, there's a lot of education folks, uh, ironically, on this, uh, on finance, yeah. uh, which, which makes for a really good mix. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, I would look forward to obviously following up with, with the chair Great. on this education commitment to make sure that it's a sustainable one. So I realize we have this immediate concern mm -hmm. of getting people immediately into the pipeline, but then we can really make sure that New Yorkers are a part of this long-term yeah. if we look at the curriculum going back to elementary school yeah, and, and, and junior high school. I think we won't have to have that type of hearing, mm -hmm. again, if you're committed to uh, looking at the education from almost from onset. I, I completely agree with you. This is this is the workforce development opportunity of a lifetime. Knowing we're going to have this many jobs um, for this long, um, and being able to think years and years ahead in terms of the training that's necessary to get people into those jobs, because it's sure it's it's forty twenty five to forty thousand jobs. But then over time, there'll be turnover. That means it's not just for 10 or 15 years, it's just for 50, 100 years. And so we have to make sure that we're training people and making sure from the very outset of their elementary school education that they're prepared for these jobs. I 100% agree. Thank you for indulging me, uh, Chair. Absolutely. OK, now we have Councilmember Moyer and uh, followed by Councilmember Lansman, uh, Rosenthal and Levin. Uh, thank you, Chairman Drum. Thank you uh, for the panel for being here. I uh, just have a couple of questions, uh, Mr. Padgett. Do you believe in Ronald Reagan's trickle-down economics? Uh, Council member, I believe in good jobs for New Yorkers. That's just, what this is just about. Just yes or no. It's just a yes or no. I got three minutes. Yes or no. I don't believe in trickle-down economics, but I do believe the city needs resources so, to so be a progressive you city. Say, I'll take that as a no. So you're coming here, and you're pitching the same idea with a new name 
called the multiplier effect. You know, you tap the multiplier effect, but this is just another corporate giveaway. They're the same old, failed, supply-side, trickle-down Reaganomics that decimated the middle class and filled the pockets of the 1%. And so when you come here and you tell us this, it's just not based on reality. And this is exactly what Paul Ryan, the Koch brothers, the Cato Institute has been selling for years. And frankly, you know, we just don't buy it here in the city of New York. And so when you come in here and you talk about this, you have to be mindful that these plans have failed. And so you say you don't believe it, but you're selling the same thing here. Council member, a multiplier effect has nothing to do with trickle-down economics. A multiplier effect is a well-known, established mechanism for looking at the fact that it's absolutely the case that when companies, technology companies come to cities, other companies are created. That's not fake news. That is well known to happen. Uh, and there's also up to 40,000 jobs. This is not trickle down. This is people who are going to be directly hired by the company. I mean, as you know, trickle down economics is the notion that um, by reducing federal corporate tax rates uh, that that will result in investment in some theoretical third tier sense that will result in ultimately them hiring more people. That's not what this is about. This is about them actually hiring 40,000 people, it's a very different circumstance over how many with all years? due respect. Over how many years? 40,000 over 15 how many years. years. Got it. Okay. Thank sorry. you. Sorry. Oh, sorry. Thank you. Thank That's you. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I'm running out of time, but I just want to ask you this. I, I asked you this at the last hearing. Will you support an expanded environmental analysis that extends through the Roosevelt Avenue corridor, which includes the entire number seven line? so we can have concrete answers on how uh, the headquarters is going to impact the people of Queens? Uh, we will do a comprehensive environmental impact analysis. I don't, I don't know about the specific borders, but we'll certainly look at all the areas that will be impacted. Um, and we're happy to talk to you about Roosevelt Avenue corridor. Great. I just want to also say this, and I'll end this uh, now, Mr. Chairman. You know, I'm just getting very sick and tired of uh, EDC, corporations, developers, uh, you know, they come in here, uh, you testify before this body, you, you, you tout this very divide and conquer method of working uh, with New Yorkers in a very positive way. And, you know, I'm, 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 I'm watching this as a chair of, of zoning and franchising where you're pitting unions against unions to cut a deal. You know, on, on the neighborhood rezonings, I've sat here, I've listened to testimony about agreements with 32BJ, but nothing for the building trades. You know, and, and, and then these giveaways. Here we have a deal, it's the trades, 32BJ, but no conversations with the RW or the Teamsters. You know, let me just be clear that the divide and conquer method is tired, it's unfair, it's immoral. Mm -hmm. And we need to start promoting access to a pathway for all unions uh, that, that have built the middle class in our city and so that when we have corporations like Amazon who come here and say that they are not going to be able to work with the labor folks in this community, you know, I want to know if we are, are going to rely on failing programs that this city has had in touts such as Hire NYC uh, for your benchmark for local hires. Uh, Council member, I think the rezonings that you're referring to as being a, a, a divide and conquer mechanism that you consider unacceptable are the ones that have passed your committee in almost all circumstances. Uh, with, with, with much objection from this and yet, chairman. And yet your vote. And, and with this chairman which I have called upon uh, having a moratorium because I believe that your agency does mm -hmm. not deal with us in good faith. You like to cut 11th hour deals. You, you deal in secrecy. Uh, and it's shameful okay. when you come here now and try to say that you are not dividing and conquering when it comes to our labor workforce with these, with these projects that have come through uh, this committee. Hey, Council Member, I'm just saying words are one thing and your votes I think my in actions favor of, speak much favor greater deals than are, yours. Are I've I think, been one of I the most agree biggest advocates, not only for labor, but worker safety. Yeah. And under your watch and under your administration, there have been more fatalities mm -hmm. of construction workers yeah. 
under this administration than anywhere else. That, that's why, I have that's been why. at the forefront of defending this, not only as an assembly member, mm -hmm. passing real legislation mm -hmm. that protects workers who this uh, administration won't even classify as death on their, on their sites because you all like to fudge the numbers here. So please don't come and tell me that I haven't been a vocal advocate for labor and labor protection yeah. here in the city of New York. I think there is then no Mr. question Patrick, that you have just, been, and we, sh we, sh we, share your, we share your desire for workers' rights, and we worked closely, this administration, with you and the council. You're, on a you're build, not demonstrating on a it with this deal, sir. Right, I'm gonna, I'm gonna not demonstrating it with this deal. I'm going to move on to the next council member. Thank uh, you, and I yeah. understand. Yeah, thank you. Uh, council member Lansman, followed by Rosenthal and Levin. Thank you. Good afternoon. Um, you start with the proposition that the purpose of economic development is to create good jobs for New Yorkers. And I think what you're hearing from the, the council is that we equate good jobs with good union jobs. It's not just wages or just benefits or just this or just that, but union jobs that allow workers to collectively bargain and um, negotiate for all of their interests. I, I've heard here and elsewhere that the construction work for this project is going to be, be union. Is, is there some deal or arrangement with the building trades that ensures that the work to build this headquarters is going to be built union? So we don't have our plans yet. We are in the very early uh, process of des design. Um, again, we wanted to be on the community, listen to, um, and, and meet with the city folks, meet with the state folks on the massing and the density of our buildings um, for the four to eight million square feet. We have met with the building trades. We have met with 32BJ. And once we have those plans, we look to formalizing those agreements. So, so there's no deal with the building trades yet? Correct. Okay. The building maintenance work, well, I hope that there is because those folks re work really hard and put a tremendous amount of um, themselves into their jobs. And as Councilmember Moyer referenced, we've had um, a number of fatalities in the city, uh, mostly in non-union workplaces. The building services uh, workers, um, represented by 32BJ, is, is there a deal in place with, with them? So, um not yet. Um, we use 32BJ in our New York uh, corporate offices. And let me also add that, um, again, we're, we're early stages here. But in Seattle, we recently expanded our campus by over 3 million square feet. We use primarily union trade workers on that, and we fully anticipate to do the same here. Right. And the workers, the 32BJ workers at your other site, are they directly employed by Amazon, or, or they're employed by contractors who you hire? Um, they are not directly employed by us. OK. So not yet, but, but hopeful on building trades, not yet, but hopeful on 32BJ at, at, at the new headquarters in Long Island City. What about the rest of the, the, the workforce? What about the, the workers who are going to work in the, the cafeteria, the workers, the clerks, the, the, the um, security personnel? Um, why, what is the, the, the resistance, and why are you choosing to cut deals with the building trades and BJ, but not with, for example, RWDSU or, or the Teamsters. I don't understand how you're making these choices. It makes me feel that you're making political decisions rather than ethical, economic ones, and that's deeply troubling to me. So, um we, well, we haven't made any deals yet, um, so we're still in you know, negotiations and discussions. And as far as our you know, in-house food service, again, we have very limited food service. Um, I'll go back to the example I, I used um, for our Seattle headquarters, where we actually um, partner with a nonprofit that um, trains previously incarcerated individuals to I, give them I, a path I get that, and, so that's, and that's fine. But limited food service as it may be, it's food service. Some people are going to be there working. They need to make a living. They need to make good wages. They need to get benefits. They need to have retirement security. They need to have security from, 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 yeah. from arbitrary termination. Yeah. And it, at the end of the day, for me, for what it's worth, it's simply not enough that you are picking and choosing some unions yeah. over others, as another member referred to it, I think, to as pitting one union against another. Yeah. Thank very, you, very we, 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 we agree. Uh, we actually, we've met with the, the a union representing the food service workers, and we are strongly encouraging the company to work with them. But we just don't know the details of their plans yet in terms of what they're going to be hiring and when. But we. So let me let me let me close with this. Yeah. Are you strongly encouraging 
And why aren't you demanding mm -hmm. that Amazon also negotiate in good faith with all of the potential unions that could cover all of the potential employees who might be covered by our union? Yes, we are. Yes, you are. We are. Absolutely Encouraging or demanding? We are absolutely. Well, first of all, we are insisting that they work with the unions that we've already discussed. Um, and, and at this facility, about this facility. So, so you are demanding that they will meet with the unions who might represent the categories of workers who are going to be employed at the Long Island City location? Yes. Okay. And what if Amazon refuses to do that? What if they refuse to meet that demand? to have those meetings? They've, they've met those demands. Okay. okay. All right, well, thank you. I know other members have questions. Okay, thank you. Council Member Rosenthal. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you all. Um, I guess a couple of questions for Amazon first. The way the subsidies are um, structured is a tax break once, the, once you hire a worker, is that right? It's so yes. Once we make the capital investment and hire the the employee, then the actual the state will audit that on an annual basis to ensure those capital investment, those jobs have been created, and then we have to actually maintain those jobs also for two years. So the longevity of the worker is two years. There's actually multiple steps in that process to ensure that those are new jobs being created. I think it's it, it's actually specifically that just for clarity that the, the the benefits can be recaptured for including the, up to the previous two years if they don't continue to maintain the overall employment level that's required will be required and this is with the state. Yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. I appreciate that. Um, okay, so I think the public needs to understand that a little bit. Is that written somewhere? Is that something the committee? Mm -hmm could get that exact information? It is very detailed, um, and it is available on our website. And we have a um, New York City microsite actually coming live. And the MOU is currently on our website and has okay. been since the day of the announcement. I have three minutes, so yes. it's one now. Um, do you have a written plan for gender and POC path to leadership? We don't have a written plan for that. We have a we have a number of very active programs within the corporation to create pathways for women uh, and people of color. How about gender nonconforming? Tenure nonconforming. Gender, oh. gender. Yes, yes. Uh, yes, absolutely. We have very strong uh, policies for our transgender. And that's employees. written. Yes, yes, it is. And absolutely. you're sending it over. So I don't. Okay. So you don't. But you don't have a written plan for a path to leadership for gender and POC? No. No. OK. Um, would you consider uh, having one for workers at every level, a written plan? Yes, um, it, maybe I'm just not kind of understanding uh, the distinction. Um, we invest uh, many resources in ensuring that our female or underrepresented minority employees reach uh, management levels. We have a variety of uh, uh, training programs. Uh, our, our HR has a central diversity team that, that works towards that. Uh, so Can you I, show the, yeah. um, I'd like to have the written yes. information okay. on that, number one. And I would like to see the outcome of yes. those investments. So over time. Right, obviously, what's the change yes. of, with those programs? Tiny little bit more. Would Amazon consider paying for outside of the deal? Uh, in addition, would you consider paying for the construction costs of a pre K to 12 school on site for, I don't know, five sections? So we've, we've already committed to providing the space for a 600-seat um, school. 600 is tiny. So what I'm asking is, would you consider paying for an additional school that's actually pre-K through 12, five sections? So as uh, Mr. Patrick previously said, we've committed to one school. There's a potential for two other schools. So. But we will consider, consider Council Member, yes. we absolutely will consider and it. I would really, I think it's important to note the differentiation between providing space and paying for the construction costs. 
That's a lesson I learned from our Riverside South deal, where the city ended up getting screwed because what we got was space. We didn't get the cost of construction. So it's a really important distinction there. And um, Mr. Patchett, what are the requirements under ICAP for MWBE companies? Uh, there's a 30 percent, there, sorry, there's a requirement under ICAP, under, so it's under state law, and there's a requirement in terms of the, the number of the companies that need to be contacted for the percentage of the respondents who have to be um, MWBE respondents as a part of the, uh, as a part of the okay. contracting. Um, I, unfortunately, I don't believe there's a specific numeric requirement in terms of I the overall percentage, right. but I believe there needs to be. Thank you, and I'm wondering if Amazon would commit to that. Um, there is a real, um, uh, um, there is a program of, of progress to, to growth for MWBEs that uh, I would wonder if you would consider in order to help our WMB community grow in its capacity. So we, we are committed to hiring MWBE um, within the MOU and within uh, a portion of the other um, the capital grant. We've also committed to a target of 30%. We agree it's very important. And um, we're working on several initiatives um, with the state and the local team to see what we can do to actually foster additional MWBE participation. So I, I guess what I'm looking for is some sort of signed MOU for that commitment because under ICAP, all you're required to do is consider MWBEs for 30% of the job, and what you have to show is that you interviewed 30%. And so what I'm asking is, would you consider a commitment to hiring 30% MWBE? I'd like to learn more about what, you, what kind of commitment you're talking about. I'm not sure we have enough time to negotiate it right here, it's but it's certainly important. It's a commitment between um, a shell game and actually hiring MWBEs. It is a priority for us. I can commit to that, and I commit to the fact that we already have the 30% target, and we hope we can exceed that. And you can show your history on Absolutely. that? Absolutely. We will be very transparent. What your history is um, I hiring cannot... MWBEs over the last five years. Yes, we can, we can get probably track that down, yeah. yeah. Track that down. What's, last question. Well, it's not a question, it's actually a statement. And, and I was listening to the exchange um, between you and Councilmember Van Bremer on the definition of a good paying job and health benefits. And the distinction that's missed um, that, I, that I think elicited the response that you got from Councilmember Van Bremer and then Adrian Adams and then Barry Grudenchek is um, a good paying job, the promise of a good paying job does not include due process, and it does not include job security. And that distinction is critical to the workers in New York City, 50% of whom are living rent burdened. So, you know, when we ask about a two-year, your, the written information about your two-year commitment to people, in order to get those tax breaks, compared to a union job which has due process. And all due process means is that if someone uh, doesn't perform well, they get an opportunity to talk about that, right? It's nothing scary. It's just an opportunity not to be fired on the spot. And so, it's important for you to understand that distinction and understand what you're saying no to and understand that your commitment even to the state where you're getting uh, tax breaks is not job security. It's a two-year job. So I appreciate your consideration. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Council Member Levin, followed by Council Member Van Bremer. Thank you, Chair. Um, so my first question has to do with um, uh, the deal as it relates to the city's um, assets. Um, the city is contributing, in addition to the tax benefits that are as of right, um, land to this deal, is that correct? Uh, we're not contributing it. 
but we're, it's part of the agreement, yes. Okay, how much land? Uh, there's the, this, I think it's, it, I think it's a little between one and two acres uh, the, to the west side of the Department of Education building, and then there's the Department of Education building, which we're still working with the company on. Okay. Which um, is about, that's about half a million. So in the aggregate, the development that's possible on that um, is probably uh, close to two million square feet, inclusive of the 550,000 square feet currently in the Department of Education building. The, the developable square feet. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. What's the what's the acreage of the land? Yeah, I think it's between one and a half and two acres. Okay. Um, and that's going to be sold to Amazon, or that's going to be leased to Amazon? Leased. 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 If, yes. Um, and what's the financial uh, compensation to the city for that lease? So it's their market terms. Um, so it's the subject to an appraisal in one case and subject to competitive procurement in the other. Okay. And what what is that? Has, has that happened yet? We haven't finalized the numbers. No. Not okay. the aggregate numbers. Has that appraisal happened yet? No, we have not started the appraisal yet. Okay. Um, as you're aware, uh, we engaged just a couple of years ago on an acquisition the city acquired um, on a similar parcel about maybe two miles south of here on the water. Yeah. Um, and uh, it was a commitment that the Bloomberg administration made this administration to their credit and your office to your credit when you were in your previous job <laughs> yeah. uh, made the acquisition mm -hmm. uh, happen. Um, that was, if I'm, my math is correct, it was about $23.5 million per acre mm -hmm. on acquisition, on, mm -hmm. on uh, M31 mm -hmm. land. Yeah. Um, uh, that, uh, you know, it was, it was $160 million on 6.8 acres, so yeah. $23.5 million. So I'd be interested to know, even you know, obviously it's not a sale, so it's a lease, so there's different, yeah. uh, interpret, you know, it'd have to be interpreted, but uh, I'd be very interested to know how in line with, with mm -hmm. that uh, valuation, the, the valuation of that parcel is. Yeah, ultimately, I mean, I think, you know, we believe the, the value of the, of, of the DOE building, at least, which is the constructed building, um, is somewhere between $200 and $400 per square for a built square foot. Mm -hmm. um, it will be subject to appraisal. Ultimately, we'll apply a discount rate to that to turn it into a, a, a annual lease payment. But mm -hmm. I, I, I hear your point um, yeah. about the comp comparability to Bushwick Inlet Park. Got it. Okay. Um, I'll try to get one more question in here. Um, so the the uh, the hiring. I just want to know from Amazon how many, and this might have been asked, but how many of these jobs will be going to New Yorkers, mm -hmm. and how many of these jobs, if you were to create a, I think it would be helpful for you to create a, a, a series of strata that say how many of these jobs are requiring an associate's degree or requiring a, a, a high school diploma how many are, or equivalency, how many are requiring an associate's, how many would be requiring a bachelor's, how many would be requiring advanced. And, 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 then, and then breaking it down, how many are, are, are going to be $75,000 and below and, and, and then on up and so that, it's, so that it's clear to us, because it's not clear to me yet, that these jobs are A, going to be going to New Yorkers, and our B are going to be available to, to a, a lot of New Yorkers who don't have advanced engineering degrees. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, and I haven't seen anything like that yet. And, and so if you could answer that, but then I wanna leave you with a suggestion, and I don't have to, I, everyone else has talked about the importance of, of union jobs, and I think that you should really appreciate this is a union town. We support our workers in this city. So I just wanna make that very clear and support all of my colleagues on that. One thing, one suggestion that I have is we have a tremendous resource in New York City. It's our uh, public college system, uh, the City University of New York. I have in my district City Tech in downtown Brooklyn. Um, you have LaGuardia. Uh, you have Queens College. You have Baruch College. You have BMCC. Um, we, have, we have so many eager graduates coming out of these schools with two and four year degrees that I would like to see a real plan from Amazon how you're going to engage CUNY and CUNY students because most of those jobs, in my opinion, should be going to CUNY graduates because they're skilled to do it, and they're graduating with these degrees, and they, and they want to stay in New York City and they want to work and, and raise their families. 
Yeah, we absolutely agree. In fact, our, uh, our campus team worked with CUNY uh, last week and spent three days on site uh, with representatives from a number of those schools, as well as from with the chancellor's office from CUNY to talk about both internships and long-term hiring. And uh, council member, just uh, today we announced uh, a new partnership with LaGuardia Community College, CUNY and SUNY for our A to US Educate program. So we've created a new certificate for cloud computing. The goal is to train um, students uh, in the skills needed to get a cloud computing job, which is one of the most in-demand uh, fields uh, anywhere in the country and here in New York, uh, be it at Amazon or elsewhere. We completely agree with you. We are very excited to start to hire those students. Yeah. And can you one, speak to like, the so yes. one so one more on that? That's also can be a dual credit program. It isn't set up here yet, but in uh, Southern California, that's available to high school students as well. Which means that you can actually enter into those uh, cloud computing jobs uh, post high school without the sec without the um, without the college component. Okay. And let me also add, as far as you asked the question about um, local hiring, I mean that was the primary reason that we chose New York City and Long Island City, so we can hire from the diverse set of talent that's already here. Just to give some example and some support um, of evidence, um, of our 5,000 employees that we already have in the city, over 60% of those are New York City residents. Mm -hmm. Okay, but what I haven't seen yet is a clear, there can be 25,000 jobs, 20,000 of them are going to come from New York City, and you know a, a breakdown about how, you know, what the strata is for for different um, educational uh, attainments, and, and, and so that we haven't seen, right? And you haven't put that out? Uh, I think that it, it, we would like to see that, uh, so we get a clear picture of just how many of those 25,000 jobs are going to be New York City residents, how many are going to be available with people with high school diplomas or equivalency, associates, bachelors, and so forth, um, and, and just have it, that, that goes to transparency here. We, we, we need to know this information. Um, so beyond kind of this program or that program or this internship or that internship, we want to see some clear numbers about what this really means for New York City residents. Thank you. All right, Councilor. We expect to see that. I'm sorry. Just we. So if you're coming back, maybe by the next time we'll have that uh, to be able to be presented. Is that all right? Is that fair? So, Councilmember, we're, we will be hiring 700 employees this year. We're still trying to determine the exact business units that will come out. Uh, let's have an in-depth conversation with you about the makeups of those jobs that we currently have in our, our workforce, uh, and I think that will answer a lot of your questions. Yeah, so, I think that's probably yeah. the best place to start is why don't we show you what we have here in New York now and some of our other big sites, and then okay. we can say, here's what we're, here's how we're thinking about it. And okay, that way but we'd like to see a plan. Okay. Great. Fair enough. Okay, thanks. Okay, thank you. Councilmember Van Bramer. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Uh, James, I just wanted to follow up very quickly on, on something, uh, sort of the exchange between Councilmember Lansman and yourself mm -hmm. about, uh, and, and I think I've quoted you right, you were strongly encouraging Amazon to uh, uh, meet with other labor unions, and I think you said that they have done so. Well, I think I, I said that they, I said, um, just to be clear, that they've met with the unions um, related to jobs at the site. About the, pro the project that we're discussing with them, um, we also have encouraged them to meet with the other unions uh, who you know, may not be possibly representing workers at this site, but would be representing potentially workers at other sites across the city. Right. And so, and Councilmember Lansman then followed up brightly, yeah. as I was thinking yeah. uh, he was going to, and say, well, why don't you compel them? Mm -hmm. uh, and and I'm not uh, doubting what what uh, might be in your or this administration's heart mm -hmm. on this, but what I am confused is with is is why you aren't using the leverage that you have, right? If we go back to what I said earlier, mm -hmm. which is you do have an opt-out clause, mm -hmm. right? There is that power. Um, and therefore leverage, right, mm -hmm. for the administration to do more than just suggest or strongly yeah. encourage uh -huh. um, uh, that Amazon not work with ICE and that Amazon mm -hmm. be neutral and work with all labor. Mm -hmm. So what I'm struggling with is, is, is why it isn't more. Aren't we ceding our power as a city here to, to actually compel them 
to act in ways that are consistent with our values. Right. I mean, you're right. We, we certainly share the council's values on this about the importance of organized labor. I, I, I know that you believe that. Um, and we absolutely uh, have insisted that they work with the unions related to this project. We just we don't have any agreements with them. We decline to provide any discretionary subsidies um, to the project in Staten Island that you're referencing. Uh, I think certainly we would have had more leverage there if we'd offered subsidies in that project, but we didn't. Uh, that project's already up and running. Uh, you know, we certainly encourage them to meet with those unions, as the mayor has done, um, and we'll continue that conversation. I guess I would just end here and, and go back to it one more time. I think that because there is the power to opt out here, and we are at such an early stage where really a lot of this is sort of conceptual Absolutely. or in the memorandum of understanding, and, and that, that the, the mayor and the city could go to Amazon right now and say, if you work with ICE, the deal is off. Mm -hmm. If you continue to be anti-union, the deal is off. Yeah. The city has that power, mm -hmm. it is just not using the power in that way right now. Well, I think you're, you know, you're, you're absolutely right. We're at the beginning of this process. I think you're right that the MOU is really a framework. It's quite clear that many or most of the details have not <clears throat> been worked out. Um, we strongly support labor. We strongly support immigrants' rights. We have a lot of negotiations ahead. Um, obviously, we, uh, we're not, in, we're not um, looking to blow up the deal, but we are certainly looking to ensure that Amazon lives up to all of its obligations. Okay, um, I'm going to now just follow up with a few final questions. I wanna talk a little bit about pilot. Mm -hmm. uh, we spoke at the first hearing about uh, how the general project plan was used to usurp the city's land use authority and decision making but not much has been discussed yet about how the pilot infrastructure fund usurps the city's budget authority. Typically, pilots that are collected by EDC are remitted to the city council, are remitted to the city's general fund, and then appropriated through the annual budget process. Mm -hmm. uh, but in this case, half of the pilot money collected will go to the infrastructure fund that is solely controlled by EDC. Does not make us happy. Uh, why were the pilots and the infrastructure fund structured to circumvent the city's budget process? I think that the, so just for clarity, it's not half of the overall pilot, it's half of the pilot associated with the, the previously city-owned sites, just for clarity, which is roughly 20 to 25 percent of the overall pilot that's available. It's about $650 million. We are happy to work with the council to ensure that the mechanism has a strong role from the council in determining how that funding is being used. The only reason that we've set it aside in a separate bucket is to ensure that it's available to be, that it is set aside and specifically earmarked for that community. It's about planning ahead for the future and infrastructure needs of the community. I think, as you know, it goes into the regular budget process. You know, there could be competing demands in the future, and we thought it was very important, looking at the experience of Seattle, to both have a plan for what are the investments today, which will work out now in partnership with the council and then and the community, and then ultimately um, ensure that there's a set of a set amount of money set aside that can be determined by neighborhood residents and leaders, community leaders at the time, because the reality is we know 10, 15 years from now, there are going to be new infrastructure needs, and we just will not be able to successfully identify all of those today. So what guarantees are in place that that process will be followed and that the um, identified needs of the community will be uh, allocated that funding? Yeah. Well, we, we need to work on an agreement with the, as part of the, we have an infrastructure subcommittee with the Community Advisory Council. One of the things we want to work out of that, out of that is what will be the mechanism for identifying the projects, but it's our commitment to have those projects identified by the community um, and the, its capacity at the time. So we're, we're completely prepared to work with the council on what that structure looks like and something that's satisfactory to you. So the pilots will not really, the, the funding won't come in for another 10 years. We won't see that money for about 10 years. Yeah. How, how are you gonna pay for the infrastructure needs before then? I mean, I think as we do in all of our uh, large scale uh, land use changes, uh, the city is gonna need to make a commitment around infrastructure investments that will be necessary to support this you know, over the next 10 years as we do in our capital planning process, and we'll work with the council as a part of that. 
So doesn't that eat into your nine to one um, return? Well, I think frankly, you know, the Councilman Bramer, I certainly will agree with this. There are, there are needs today in that community. Um, it's not about this deal. It's about Long Island City and shoring up its infrastructure in general. Um, and we want to work with them to, with, with the community, the council member, or the, the other members of the community to identify what the critical needs are today. Um, and I, those are not necessarily because of Amazon. It's just because of, frankly, going back to the original rezoning of Long Island City before any of our time, um, there was no significant infrastructure commitment made because the expectation was that it would be commercial development mixed in with residential development. The reality is it was residential development happened almost exclusively, and the city at the time didn't have a plan for that. Um, so it's our, our uh, what we want to do is actually develop a plan for what the infrastructure investments are that are necessary. Well, we look forward to working with you on that yes, and uh, getting an accounting on that funding. Uh, the New York State executive budget has what appears to be an additional tax break for Amazon. Uh, because of the Tax Cut and Jobs Act, certain capital grants, seemingly including the $505 million that the state will give to Amazon, are currently taxable on the federal, city, and state levels. However, Part X of the Revenue Article 7 would exclude these grants from taxation by the city and state. So for Amazon, is it your understanding that this state budget, the state budget provision would make the capital grant you will receive tax-free on the state and city level? I'm not familiar with that provision. I don't know. Neither am I. All right, well, we will follow up with that um, at the next hearing then because um, sure. that's a little something, a little ditty we found in the state budget. Um, <laughs> state budgets are interesting places. Yes, they are. Very, very interesting. Um, okay, um, how will um, Amazon um, be tracked in the budget, in our budget here? How will the benefits, how will it be tracked in the city's budget? Yeah, we haven't set, set up a specific mechanism at this point for tracking it. That being said, uh, you know, the, 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 there, you know, there will be specific reporting required um, under the city's leases with the company, um, and certainly the state will have, because they're under their discretionary incentives, will require them to report the number of jobs on a regular basis. Uh, <coughs> so we'll be happy to share all that information with so the with, council. So with the revenues and uh, expenditures from the pilot infrastructure be reflected in the budget? Well, certainly the, certainly the pilot revenues would. I mean, I think that there, there are certain laws that govern whether or not the city is allowed to share, or sorry, the city or the state are allowed to provide tax information about specific taxpayers, but um, you know, we'll be happy to share whatever we're allowed to share under, under the law. Okay, we're gonna end, I think, with a tweet and then a f final statement. Um, a tweet from Alex, a New Yorker. Uh, you talk about the economic growth supporting local shops. What, excuse me, what steps are you taking to prevent massive rent increases for Queens residents and businesses? Yeah, I think, it, I think it's, a, it's a really important question. Uh, you know, clearly there uh, is a need for the city to be consistently investing in affordable housing. Um, you know, as it happens, 2018 was a record year. Uh, the city uh, had more than 34,000 units uh, uh, preserved and new affordable units, which was by far the biggest number of units in affordable housing in the city's history. Uh, I think it's a significant testament to the type of work this administration is committed to, um, in addition to working in Albany to strengthen the city's uh, rent laws uh, as a part of this legislative session. Okay, and uh, much work remains to be done on that in, the, in Albany as well. Absolutely. Um, let me ask Amazon finally, can we have your commitment that uh, you will appear to testify at the council's third oversight hearing? Yes, we're already committed to that. I believe it's on February 27th. We will be there. Okay, thank you. Yes, and with that, uh, we're going to adjourn this meeting. I thank you all for coming in. Thank you. And this meeting is adjourned at 1.12 in the afternoon. Thank you.